You are listening to the Gritty Podcast, where we talk about all things gritty. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Brian Call, and in the studio with me, I have Brad Hunt, and our podcast guest today is Matt Davis. I was in Alberta this year hunting mule deer with my good friend Pedro Ampuero. Yeah. Pedro and I, you know, the Spaniard who pretends to put holes in my air pad, that guy, he and I, uh, you know, we have a great time together, and we're always giving each other crap. And it was fun. Uh, we knew we had to go on another hunt. We got together. We went to Alberta and, uh, we chased some muleys with our bows and it was a short, short hunt, but it was great. Came really close to getting uh, a great buck. Anyway, we left and right after we left, Brian McElray yep. and Matt Davis, Brian B-Mac. McElray from Hush, yep. BMAC and Matt Davis from, I guess, Hoyt and, and, and Mountain Ops. All things business. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, went up there and. And and they took over where we left off on this hunt, and uh, and then a little bit ago, Hush dropped a video of the hunt, and I, it's funny I got to see the I recognized the country, oh, that and I cool. even recognized one of the deer that uh, we were after, Pedro and I. Anyway, we followed along with the film and uh, the story. It was pretty cool. If you go to the Hush video channel, you can go and watch it. I watched the video. It was great. It's really cool to see a bow hunt and for especially a bow hunt over top a buck of that caliber mm-hmm. that that's being pursued in this video and to see these guys get close at full draw, heart pounding. It's just great content. So I got to talking to Matt after I watched the video and he was telling me the story and how it all came to be. And I was like, dude, we have got to have you on the podcast and hear hear that story so it was cool got to talk to matt we sat down and he shared the experience and yeah. and and how it all kind of unfolded and one of the reasons i i love these kinds of shows is because i want to learn from what what like what matt and what b mac what they were doing that got him in those positions and and how ultimately they succeeded on a giant deer so I want to, I want, that's kind of the goal is learning, education. Yep. But I also like to be entertained and exactly. I also like to be inspired. And if we can hit all three of those on a podcast, I figure we did something right. So uh, at least one or two, well, we know we hit at least one. There's a lot <laughs> to learn, I think, from this episode. Anybody, any, any, any time you can get in the pocket, you know, and tight in on mule deer yeah, and that red any zone. animal with a bow um there's something to be learned there if you like the podcast let us know in the comments below subscribe to the channel also uh consider checking out advanced outdoor technology their aot mounts mm-hmm. which they basically bolt to your bow we've talked about them a number of times there's a link below in yep. the description field but your release your mechanical release magnetizes right to your bow and it kind of locks lock. on. Yeah. We've been talking about it for a while. It is one of my favorite products from 2023. I was 100% skeptical until I hunted with it well, all fall. I was a thousand percent skeptical, <laughs> but check it out. Yes. Uh, it's AOT uh, mounts. Use the code gritty over there or the link below in our description field. I'm telling you, you want it. Yes. Hands down, you want it. You don't want to not have it. It is crazy. No more searching for no, your no, release. Nobody that's got one has been like, yeah, this is dumb. I'm not using no. this anymore. Everyone has got it is like, wow, changes everything. Exactly. So check it out, AOT. And also, we're big fans of the Tricer tripods and Tricer heads. We did mm-hmm. a podcast on it not too long ago. Yeah. Consider checking that out if you're in the business and, and you're shopping for a, 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 a lightweight, uh, solid tripod. Check out Tricer. Yep. Use the code Gritty over there. And without further ado, let's jump into the show. All right, folks, welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Call, and I have Brad Hunt here Mm -hmm. as my co-host, and then our guest today is Matt Davis. The one and only. (laughs) There's a whole bunch of people named Matt Davis, but but I am the only me, that's for sure. So, uh, So, Matt, it's great to see you. It's been a while. We haven't seen each other in quite a long time. Been a minute. I moved to Logan. You're you're over here, and where are we, Heber? Yeah, we kind of went different <laughs> directions, right? We were both pretty close to yep. the Mountain Ops office, and then you went north, and I went south. 
Uh, when I first met you, it was a long, it was a long time ago. Uh, you were still working at Hoyt, I think. Yep. And so you were at Hoyt Archery or Hoyt Bows. Yep. Archery, and, yeah. And then um, from there, you transitioned into working at Mountain Ops. Yep. And we continued our friendship there. I had the studio in the same uh, building as you for a couple of years. Yeah. So we got to spend a lot of time together. We've known each other a long time, working the same same place. And uh, it's, it's I've always respected you and really um, valued your opinion. We've had podcasts about archery, uh, front of center arrows, <laughs> chucker know, hunting, <laughs> chucker hunting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Just, just a, bu- a bunch of stuff. So, um, and uh, ironically, I was, you know, I, w- I, I was in uh, Alberta, in Canada, just the week before you got yep. there, where you shot a giant buck, and I, I saw the video of the some of that uh, on uh, BMAC and and team over at Hush Hush, and they put the the film out, and I yep. got to see it. You were in the same country. In fact, BMAC was on one of the same box that Pedro and I were on. Cause we had been there a week earlier, Pedro, uh, Ampuero, for those that know he, he's a friend of ours. He's been on our, on, on our films. A few, most people know Such Pedro by dude. now. Yeah. Such a good guy. Our archery uh, fanatic. And he and I, um, knew we had to do another hunt together. And so we, we went in and we went on this mule deer hunt in Alberta and it was really awesome. It was so cool. So I got to be there just before you were. So, I knew you were coming and, uh, I heard from the guys. And so I was anxious to see how, so I was getting the play by play here and there from Jeff, like, (laughs) you know, they're on a giant buck, you know, and all this, and I'm getting photos throughout the hunt. And then of course, last day, you know, you, you shoot this giant mule deer Mm -hmm. with your bow, Mm -hmm. um, definition of a team buck. This, this deer is for sure. I wanted to get um, m- more details on that um, hunt, and and especially you you told me a little bit off camera yeah. that final stock, and I think it's such a cool story. So I want to <laughs> I want to get the details on that. But before we do that, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the bow you took with you, the setup, the rig, and what you did to prepare for the, that trip? Yeah. So so gear wise, ironically enough. Um, literally probably three days before I left Hoyt was coming out with their new, with their new bows. And, uh, uh, the hush guys all work with Hoyt. I was obviously previously employed there and, uh, Jeremy Eldridge hooked me up with a bow, but like last second, and <laughs> yeah. part of me was like, I'm not taking this bow. I had an RX five that was several years old. I'd had great success, killed some great animals with that bow. And you get a bow three days before you leave. And it's kind of like, Man, oh yeah and <laughs> like this is and i'm I'm fairly busy got lots going on still doing a bunch of stuff for mountain ops uh working on final rise my own business and so it was kind of like oh man what am i gonna do here so i get the bow actually end up running up to meet my buddy chris neff uh, who worked at mountain ops as well chris is a bow wizard mm-hmm. help me just throw everything together quickly i knew how to do those things i didn't have a bow press or i don't have a bow press currently i didn't have all the tools run up there paper tune the bow and come back and I've got basically two days, right? So I, I don't even, so, <laughs> so, so I, <laughs> so you didn't like tinker and plan with this setup, like for months before you left and all that. No, this was, and it, fortunately it shot very similar to, to previous bows that I've owned. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, b- bows are always changing, but for the most part, they're and pretty the confidence similar. confidence that comes with the bow you shot for a long time. It's, it's hard like to, irreplaceable. It, it, it's, and it's hard to put down. And I know what this hunt is because I've been before. I'd gone on this hunt with Jeff five years before. Now, I'd done it with the recurve. So in my mind, and I got a little bit of a vendetta because the last day of that hunt, I actually, coolest stock of my life. I won't shake out. I get long-winded. Anyway, <laughs> sneak in on this buck. He comes up out of his bed. I'm shooting my recurve. I shoot a clicker boat does the whole down dog and he stays in that stretch position a little too long and i launch one right over his back at like 15 yards and he jumps up he runs out to 40 and boom another arrow's on the way and i thought i hit him perfect left to right was perfect but it was just tall Mm. in my mind i've killed this deer right and this is saturday so in you hunt for a week there and you can't legally hunt on sundays so 
and it's I've always gone the last week of their season, so usually the guides are picking up and going home. Jeff's yep. been up there since like September. He comes from uh, bear hunting down there. He scouts deer, and then he's away from his family, his wife, everything for for a long period of time. So I know he's usually the truck's probably loaded Saturday <laughs> morning, getting ready to go. So, anyways, we went in Saturday morning, and there's this buck that I'd shot out in the field just grazing. Just- and I just shot him tall. I shot him through no man's land, right in that triangle, right over the top of the lungs. Didn't kill the deer. He was just out doing his thing. So you were looking forward to round two. I'm like round Second two. Second chances. Yeah. I, I, I switched to a compound like three years before I drew a really good limited entry tag and actually killed uh, Boone and Crockett antelope with my bow. I found the buck and I'm like, I'm getting a compound. <laughs> 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 I knew what that goat was. Anyway, so yeah, yeah. Went, went back to I shot compounds for a long, long time prior to doing all the recurve stuff. But anyway, so I get this bow. Chris helps me set it up. Um, I've got a 3D target in my backyard. And um, I literally take my sight off of my other bow. And I'm like, how far yeah, can I cool. match this sight tape? So I shoot, I, I shoot 30, 40, 50. I shoot a three pin slider, a 30, 40, 50, and then I'll dial past that. I know in my mind, I'm like, because I've done this hunt before, I'm like, dude, I'm going to be under 50. So I'm not super worried about the rest of my sight tape, Mm -hmm. but I shoot in about about 65 yards. Those trajectories held true. Um, Now, I did back the bow down to 60 pounds. I was only shooting 60 pounds. Um, Two reasons for that. The first reason is I hadn't shot my bow a lot. Um, I didn't really bow hunt much this early season. August for us here at final rise is like super busy. Like September one is when all the bird seasons kick off. So you got all your Western upland hunters that are like, dude, it's like July happens and somebody opens a floodgate. So August is kind of a busy time for us. I had drawn a really good rifle elk tag in Wyoming. So I wasn't worried about killing a a meat cow for the freezer. So I kind of, I didn't bow hunt. I didn't bow hunt this year. Early season. I did shoot a bear uh, with Jeff. Uh, in the springtime. Anyways, I hadn't shot my bow. Yeah. So yeah. I'm not in good shooting condition, <clears throat> but I know there's obviously. So you went to 60 pounds. I was shooting 60 pounds. So I know. What's your draw length? 30 inches. Okay. So I know, I mean, I've, I've got the, I got the full stroke, right? I got the benefit <laughs> of the long arms, yeah, yeah. but I know there's a chance that I'm going to be right on top of this deer. I need to hold my bow for an extended period of time, potentially. And I'm probably not going to shoot past 50 yards. Now, this is all coming from experience of shooting a recurve that's shooting a 600 grain arrow, 170 <laughs> right. feet per second. Right. And I had no problem killing stuff out to 40 yards with that. Yeah. No problem. So I know this compound. Yeah. It's got, you got to take care of it. I got sauce, dude. Like, I'm good. Like, but, I know. You're not shooting a fast arrow. No, no, I bet you the arrow's 260 to 260. I didn't, I, 265, I haven't even like chronographed that. it. I actually got one of those new Garmin chronographs in the mail today. I'm <laughs> yeah. going to go shoot it. But <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what this bow shoots, but I, I practice out to 60 yards, figure out what my limits are, and I'm setting my expectations for what this hunt are. Yeah. I shoot the, the following day uh, multiple times. You know, I'm practicing shooting from my butt, shooting from my knees, just going through scenarios that I've previously encountered yeah. on this hunt kind of trying to okay we're trying to boost that confidence and win right. some of that back right because yeah. in my, the back of my head i'm like new bow new dude bow. like gosh dang anyways um so i probably shot maybe 40 arrows total through the bow okay by the time that i that i left to go up there hmm. but i was dialed right. you felt good and it pounded i mean it shot well yeah yeah it's tempting for um a guy to draw too much have too much poundage, especially, you know, if, if it, it, coming back at it, um, the dry slot, draw cycles are nice though. Oh my gosh. And they're, and they're, they're so much better than it used to be. Mm-hmm. But, uh, and you're not a slight guy. No, so. I, could, I could shoot 70 pounds. No problem. <laughs> but I'm just thinking through all those, again, just trying to set myself up, self up for success. And the other yeah. thing is, is I knew it was going to be cold. Yeah. If I crawl in on a deer and I've got gear on me and I sit on that deer for two hours and finally he stands up, like there were stocks I was on last time I sat on the deer all freaking day. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, dude, if it's, I mean, we knew it was going to snow, it was going to be in the negatives. I'm like, (laughs) dude, I have to be able to draw my bow. I have to be able to draw my bow without hurting myself and then be in a position that I'm not panicking. I'm mentally stable through my shot process, like calm, cool, collected. Mm -hmm. And so I was just trying to do everything with my equipment that I could Mm -hmm. to protect myself mentally, I guess, more than anything, because I knew I could make the shot. That's dear. Draw early and draw often and hold for a long time, like, (laughs) is the key to getting a buck with a a 
buck with a bow. Yeah, sure. I agree. Okay, so then you uh, you that's your prep. Yeah, <laughs> really. I'd shot my other bow quite yeah. a bit leading up to that. I didn't anticipate getting the bow in time, so I was just I was still shooting, but I wasn't. What was the uh, arrow build? So I shoot. Um, you, you mentioned earlier high FOC. I'm still a proponent of heavy arrows of higher FOC, so I still shoot the Valkyrie system. Mm -hmm. I mean, tried and true in so many applications on so many animals that I've shot, and I just know that it works. I mean, yeah. if there was one thing that gave me confidence, it That's was that arrow setup. So um, I shoot a, a VAP Elite uh, full-length arrow. I think they're like 31 and change long, um, which is perfect. And then I shoot their, is it his 55-grain collar? He's got a 50, he's mm -hmm. got a standard and then like a 55 and a 75, I think. Brent, mm -hmm. I apologize. I haven't looked at your website. I just, I just had all the components. Yeah. It was, right. it was very similar to what I shot out of my recurve, right. but I was shooting the 180 grain Jagger, um, solid, not a big vented fan personally, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. whistling and other reasons like right. that, but I just like a solid broadhead. If I'm trying to build something that's bulletproof, I'm not going to be stamping out holes in the middle of my broadhead. Yeah. So personal two cents. Three fletch. Uh, four, four fletch. fletch, still shooting a four fletch. Um, I shoot the, God, what are they? The AAE hybrids, that really stiff mm -hmm. vein. Is that, is that, is that the, the hybrid? The uh, AAE hybrid? Dude, th it's I'm not stiff. sure. I haven't shot the Oh, no, 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 no. It's the Boeing Heat Blade. Heat That's blade. what yep. I was shooting. Yep. The guys yep. over at uh, Wild oh, Arrow recommended that. They said that that had done really well for them. So was it an offset or a helical? A slight offset. Just a slight okay. offset is all. Yeah, with a four mm -hmm. fletch. Yep. Yep. Um, Okay. Uh, arrows. I mean, I obviously go as I build, I'm very meticulous as I build my arrows, spin them all, shoot all my arrows, number Did them you one change through the whatever. I do. I shoot uh, the Easton, um, yeah. the, is it the X-Knock that fits in yeah. there? Yeah. Yeah. Um, shoot the Easton X-Knock and usually you're chomping on them or flexing it over your tooth to just try to get that perfect knock fit, yeah. but knock fit, but go through and shot every single basically every single broadhead. And then I go and sharpen them. I have Brent's thing, but it's like, I mean, I had, I was very confident it, yep. given the yeah. little limited amount of time. I I'd already done much of my homework and I was, I was ready to rock and roll. Did you, um, did you change up your release? Um, what, how did you end up with the one you, you decided to hunt with? So I, I, when I switched back to a compound, I bought, um, I think it's John Dudley's. It's called the backstrap release. And Carter previously made this exact sure. same release yeah. like 10 years before. They, I think they discontinued it. It wasn't very popular. Um, Dudley picks something up and it gets traction usually. <laughs> he's, yeah. he, he's done well for himself and got a great reputation. Anyway, so when that came back, so I came from shooting a clicker off of my recurve, right? So mm -hmm. inducing essentially back tension and mm -hmm. having a psycho trigger. And I knew... I'm like, if all I have to focus on is aiming my bow and just pulling through the shot, like I'm all about that. Yeah. And the fact that it's essentially a finger puncher, I mean, it's a rocket, it's a wrist rocket if you want mm -hmm. to send it. Like, mm -hmm. and I played around with that. I knew that like, if I had an elk point blank and I needed to just dump the string, yeah. you can do I, that. I knew how to work through that shot. But if I had, for example, my big antelope that I shot, first arrow was at 82 and yeah, all day, I, I, just, all day to sit there and just pull through the shot, bonk, hit him perfect. He ran to me. I shot him again. Explain that to people, how that release works. So the release itself, so it's essentially a kind of like a back tension release. It's a tension release. Um, it has settings within it. Usually you set it, you know, five or 10 pounds higher than what your holding weight of your bow is. So it's good to have a scale, mm -hmm. play around with that. And really Pounds just, of pressure so that mm -hmm. it basically goes off by, by pounds of pressure applied to exactly. it as you pull. And the trigger piece or the finger piece that looks like just like a normal like release, release, that's the safety. So once you engage that, it trips the sear. And now you're going through your shot process. Yep. So you have to trip that and then start pulling. Kind of like the sweet spot mm -hmm. where you can – you have a safety. What you mean is uh, – because some of those back tension releases, they're a little scary because if, if there's no safety – and you're excited, you're, and you just like pull through. Mm -hmm. you, it just goes off. Yeah. During videos the you see draw. people punch themselves in the face. Yep. That's yep. what happens. Well, oh, that could just be a hinge <laughs> rotation or something. But, yep. but a number of things. But right? a number of things. But but uh, so when you're through your when you're pulling through with that release and it's in your draw in your draw cycle, you have the safety on. There's no way it can go off. There's no during way the that, draw. No way for that to go. Anchor. Off. You get there. You probably put it on target. You're like, okay, if it accidentally went off. 
I'd still be in I'm the there. ballpark. Yep. Then you release the safety. You actually you have to squeeze you have to it. Squeeze it. You have to oh. squeeze it like a normal. So you have to like close your hand on it and then keep that pressure on. It's basically just like an index release. It is. Yeah. You pull that trigger instead of the trigger releasing the the string. It's the safety. Yeah. Then it's, you're pulling through like a back tension. Yes. It is. It's yep. a really hmm. cool release. And I like. I've never used it. It's. I mean, I bought another one in case he ever stopped making them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's a, it's a really really good product. And again, like on animals, there's just different stress, right? Like what you're like, you can be as calm, cool, collected as you want, but there's mm-hmm. tension in your body. You might be a little tense, and so just getting rid of those variables. Hunting's so, about variables, so I'm just trying to yeah. control that. So all you got to do basically is you're probably pushing and pulling. You're putting that pin right on there, and you're just just back tension on that release. Mm-hmm. And until it goes off. Yep. I just I just close my <clears throat> hand on it. That pin's there, mm-hmm. and I'm just aim, 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 aim until it breaks. There's no 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 finger manipulation, no thumb nope. manipulation, none of that kind of stuff. Nope. It's Once just you just start that adding that pull. Yep. And uh, how many pounds have you got yours adjusted to? Do you, do you know, or do you just guess? Just I, by I, I had to play with mine a little bit because it was it was set up for a 70 pound bow, uh-huh. and when I switched to the 60, I like I couldn't get it to go off. I couldn't pull hard enough. There wasn't enough pressure mm-hmm. with the way it was set, so. Mm-hmm. I basically just played tinkered around. With it I just tinkered it, yeah. with it until it it. I was able to. If I needed to dump it, I could dump it, but I could pull through it and and execute the shot. I've so. been shooting. Joel Turner turned us on to at the last Western Hunting Summit we were at. He turned us on to the Onyx, the Stan Onyx. Yep. Cl- yeah. Thumb clicker, button clicker. Thumb button clicker. And uh, but I do. It's funny, you know how the release sits in my hand and like at 40 or 50 yards, I can kind of just pull on the thumb and, and, and you feel it. Cause there's quite a bit of travel in, yeah, in yeah, mine. And you can set it up hot. You can set yeah. it up to where it pulls a lot of travel. Like so trigger. I yeah. like to know during, as I'm squeezing, you know, that it's, that I'm pulling through. That you're getting there. Yeah. But admittedly, as I drop back to 95, hundred yards, you know, 90 yards, um, I find that, um, it's a little harder for me to stay the pin, precise where I need it while I'm trying to manipulate my thumb. And um, what I find is I kind of, I, I get into that release and I naturally put tension and push pull. It stiffens me up on the shot yep. a lot. And I'm actually back tension shooting it. And yep. I'm just like, pull, 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 boom. Yep. And the shot goes and I'm way more on target at those. I can't, I can't shoot long range very effectively by manipulating my thumb. Yep, it's just got to be that constant push pull. Yeah, push pull. Elbows but you know, I don't. I don't notice that I'm like that at those 50, 60, 70 yard ranges. Yeah, I don't. I don't feel the. Com- I can feel. I can at the, when I'm really far and that pin is obscuring the target. That's when I'm like, man, you're kind of bouncing a little too much. Uh, you're not really on on, and I end up kind of just figuring out a way to compensate. And that ends up being that I'm kind of holding it. I'm not really thumb button and it goes off and it's like, Oh, I didn't even like feel the travel. Yeah. It's a different shot. And so then I've played with uh, each technique and I'm fairly proficient with either one now, but it's the same release, but I'm shooting it completely different. Yeah. 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 Very, very, very similar. And I just like wrist releases index, whatever you want to call them. Like, it's on my wrist. I can't lose it. Like there's, I, I, to me, there's a lot of pros to that personally. And it was just fairly so, consistent to like, if yep. I have, I have a big hand and if I hold it like this or like this, or I squeeze if it you too got, much, if you got a glove, a hand, a hand, hand release, your yeah. hand sweaty, like there, I mean, like literally I, I have, I have to set, I have to push the index piece right. to release the safety. And then from there, it doesn't matter if I've got gloves or whatever, mm-hmm. I still have to um, apply that amount of force to get the shot to break. So it's yeah, like, yeah. it just eliminates for me <clears throat> shooting my recurve, right? It was, I'd get to anchor and I'm looking, I have nothing to aim with unless I was gap shooting at longer distances, but you're just sitting there looking and just pull, pull, pull until you hear that clicker. And then mm-hmm. it's a psycho trigger. So it was so, it was to me, Interesting. it was psychologically the exact same thought process. I'm like, dude, I know that yeah. that works. Mm-hmm. So when I come over to shooting a compound, even that pin's doing this freaking number, dude, I don't even care because yeah. it's just black magic that that arrow I goes know. right where it's supposed to. So yeah. I don't even worry about it. I'm know. just like, just aim, just aim. I, I'm so yeah. confident nowadays when I walk up to any target, it's just like, mm-hmm. I just miss small. That's what I... Yeah. That's what I do. I miss small. And you have to because, be okay with that because, because that, that is the name of the game. Because that pin doesn't ever stay where I want it. And I'm like, but 
faith. Like I yeah. just, I know that if I just squeeze through, uh, and it's a surprise break, I'm always close. And it's funny cause you're like, I'm doing it and every single time I'm like, well, that broke, that shot broke and the pin wasn't right where I wanted. And I thought the shot was going to be a lot worse than it was because where it went and, but cause it, it's correcting faster than I can see it. Absolutely. And so I'm like, it looked to me like it was going to be, and yet the group is like Stack. beautiful. Yeah. And it's so hard to override your, your mind. I was talking to Brad on the way up here. I'm like, when I shoot now, I'm content with missing small. I don't care about my groups. Like I don't go, dang it, man. I want a tighter group. I'm like, I missed small. Every shot was in the kill zone. Yep. Whether it's 95 or it's 25, every shot was in that insert. I'm like, live with it. Because yep. as long as I count every sh- shot as a surprise you know, or a controlled shot, I'm like, then I won. I agree. It's the same with, with a gun and with a bow. My shot se- sequences are the same. And when that shot breaks, you know it was mm-hmm. good. You know if it was good or you know if it was right. bad. <laughs> yeah. and, but it's like when it was good, it's going to yield the result that you're after. I'm, I'm a hunter, right? Like yeah. if I'm dumping the string, I'm trying to kill something. I'm not, yeah. I don't need to cut that exact hair right. or put it exactly. on that exact spot. Like you're not shooting. I got to hit. I want to. I want <laughs> right. to. I pick a spot, aim yeah. small, miss small. Yep. But like if I, if I shoot to the back a little bit, <clears> I'm, I'm, ex- <laughs> I'm excited to get into the story where, where you shot the buck because. <laughs> <laughs> there's there are, a lot of this going on. There's a lot of things happening, but I can see how um, I've been there. Uh, Joel is like practice taking as long as possible mm-hmm. to pull through the shot. So he's like, okay, squeeze, squeeze, but squeeze so slow. Keep squeezing, but go such a minute, like slow pace that um, you're trying to make it go off as slow as possible, but you're still continuing to apply the pressure. Yep. When you do that, you recruit focus in a way that you just don't if you're just dumping all the time you recruit like a month goes by three months six months goes by and it's like as the pin kind of moves off target my my process at squeezing slows down like it's still in motion it's still in motion but it goes yeah and then as i move back on it goes it resumes and there's these micro adjustments the peep and the side housing sort of drift and then they come right back and it's like, okay, continue the shot. Oh, continue. And there's this constant micro adjusting throughout the whole shot process because I'm controlling it all the way. And then it goes off and the, and now it's just getting tighter and tighter and more effective. So I think when the animal does something or you're in that moment or like your release freezes <laughs> in the snow, like you're able to not wet the bed you're able to go recruit your focus keep it all lined up keep going through keep 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 and you just master that ability to like force it to stay focused and on on point so i want to get into that later but (laughs) well um and i think there's something to say like you said you shot your antelope at 82 yards there's a lot of people are like oh that's such a long shot we've killed a lot of elk at 70 80 85 yards and there's something about that because that animal is not aware that you're there most of the yeah. time. And there is something about being able to be so calm <clears throat> that you can really actually focus on just the shot and not yeah. rushing the adrenaline, the, the animal moving. Like you can just sit back and it's like you pull through and yep. you know that that arrow is good. And that, that you're far enough away most of the time that the animal is like, has no idea. Yeah. No idea. You know, it was a sad realization for me, Matt, was when I realized <clears throat> that my form and how I gripped the bow and, you know, so, cause I'm not, I'm not really that good at any of that, but what I have is a, a high hold weight and a surprise release. That's it. Like everything else is out of balance, a little whack, like it's not perfect. And yet I'm pretty damn good. And that's, that's all, all, all I do is try to have a high hold weight and, and, and a, a surprise shot, a controlled yep. shot. And so many things get fixed. Yep. I mean, just get boom. Yep. A lot of truth to it, man. It's crazy. So I still want to tinker with all the other stuff, but that is what was kind of surprising was really, you could have a pretty lousy setup, not with the best tuning, not with the best anything, blah, blah, blah. But mostly when guys are just wet in the bed and they're not very good shots, it has way less to do with any of that. It's not their equipment. It's what's between your ears. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So true. Because <laughs> I've, I've and I've experienced it. I've 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 done the blackout stuff. I've I've been there. I've been on that journey. Before. Me too. 
I've been on that journey and that's yeah. part of the process. So not so, immune from it. Getting back to the hunt, Ken, yeah. so you're ready, you get there. You've got the antlers right here. I do. You, what does it score? Uh, 193 and three eighths is what we roughed it at. Very, just <laughs> 193 kinda. and three eighths. Now I saw some people say liar, liar. <laughs> <laughs> what you guys don't see is main beam. Yeah. Like it's hard Let's to see talk about beam. that a little bit. Cause this buck is beautiful, but, uh, where's, where's all the uh, hidden score? Uh, primarily you're the, Again, when you look at this deer head on from the side, you can't tell how long his main beams are. His main beams are pushing 27 inches each, which is an incredible length. Yeah, because from the side, he's kind of like those it, white tails that narrow, curve in right? and touch. Yeah, yep. he's not very... I mean, honestly, the deer, even to me, I mean, I knew there wouldn't necessarily be ground shrinkage, but I was in awe. Mm-hmm. walking up on this deer, finally getting my hands on. I'm like, dude, this is like, cause you, and you know this, but like the deer in Alberta, their bodies, I've killed <laughs> cow elk smaller than these deer. Yeah, right, they're, like, gigantic. they're giant. So it's like, I knew the deer was big. We knew it was big, big. Mm-hmm. Um, but to get up to that deer and actually put your hands on it, it was mm-hmm. just like, dude, well, this, you got it never stops. Long main beams, but then you got an extra. Well, yep. not really an extra, but if the fork, but yep. you have that inline here. Yep. It's like you have another yeah. eye guard that's another inch and a quarter, I, probably. I never saw that until I got up to him. There was no angle I ever saw that deer that I noticed that. I mean, I looked through at him through a spotter the first time I saw him, and he's bed bladed a couple times. He's, yeah, yeah he's he just got that. Uh, this little, beam right here, how it gets bladed and fat, it's yeah. crazy. Um, there's a, we, lot, there's a lot to him, that's yeah. for sure. Pedro and I did not see a buck of this caliber <laughs> when we were there. Um, <laughs> but um, we saw some nice ones. And yeah. we were, you know, we really only had about five days of real hunting because we got one day, just got blown out the yeah. weather. Uh, that was every day of our hunt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, we, we had a great time. We got, we had a great hunt. It's a, it's a great film. Um, I'm excited. To we see need it. to go. I need to go. Uh, I want another run at it. Um, so we didn't see a buck like this, but, but, um, they're there. They're, yeah. you, that's, what's funny is you can scour that place and all of a sudden, and the closer you get to the rut, you know, and mm-hmm. all that, they're just, boom, there's a giant. Yeah. Um, I love the open country. This is your second time. Second time. There. There. Yep. W- what are your thoughts on this, this hunt? There's there's a lot of pros and cons to it, essentially. I think, um, obviously, open country means you can see, but that means that they can, can as well. Right. The, the nice thing about that country is these bucks like to lay in that red brush, and that is about the only place that they will bed. And it's really only deep enough that a big buck like that can't hide, yep. and they stick out like goalposts and so you can play the long range game of sitting and and picking apart a lot of country because it's open Mm -hmm. and you just go from red brush patch to red brush patch and you can just scratch these deer out and there's a lot of beds i'm sure you saw i mean they're Mm -hmm. like craters these deer use the same thousand years (laughs) no i mean there are (laughs) holes in the ground like those deer will just disappear Mm -hmm. when they lay in them but if it's a, a buck of this caliber, there's just nowhere for them to hide. Only if you can't get the right angle to actually see them. And that happened to us a couple times. We just got fortunate the second night we'd been out hunting. Um, I was with Josh and and Jeff and we're driving back and Jeff's like deer. And these deer are out there. And we jump out to look at them and put the spotter on and this buck standing in the spotter and it's just like oh my gosh dude and he's got eyes on us. i mean this deer is like mm-hmm. it's looking at us and on the video a doe comes up to him and like nuzzles him he doesn't break eye contact like he's like it's like he's staring into your soul it's like you <laughs> smart turd smart like and yeah. he and he proved that over the next couple of days you know we had a uh, a couple different Jeez, stocks on so him big and he was so smart. Stood. He would bet as high as he could. He'd set his landmines right. He had a couple of does and a small buck that he ran with. He would always put them on the upwind side. He would have the wind at his back mm. so he could smell you if you were coming up behind him. And then he would look over the open country where he could see. Mm. The first time we bumped him, again, uh, that red brush, it's a positive and it's a negative, right? 
If, right. if you don't know there's a deer there, especially a doe, and you never saw her and she laid there all day and you thought you had she's the coast gonna clear, you, right? she's going <laughs> to hose you. And that's what happened the first time we set up on him. We ended up getting, we went in looking for him because we hadn't seen him. He ends up coming into this field. We get set up below him and he just lays on this perch. I mean, this deer would just lay down the whole time. I mean, very rarely did we see this deer on his feet unless he was running away, but he hmm. would just lay there. Yeah. He would just lay there and just look. I think he's pretty much nocturnal for the right. most part. He would just, but he'd, he'd show himself. You could see him. Yeah. But he would just, he would just lay there and just watch. And, uh, anyways, tried sneaking around on him. When we got below him, it was like, hey, you're kind of, Josh was kind of in the escape route. I'm like, I'm going to see if I can get all the way around him, even maybe if he smells me or just like a gentle bump. Maybe he'll just move away from that and come right past you. It was really our only play, and we tried, and it didn't work out. But he ran across the draw, literally seven, 800 yards, uh-huh. and laid back down and looked at us. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, watching holy, his walking, watching his back trail, like he uh-huh. le- and on a bare hillside. Yeah. And I'm like, Dude, this deer is so smart, which makes it that much more fun, right? Not oh, only yeah. is, it a, is it an incredible deer. But he, he's not just genetics. He's big because he's also smart. Yeah. It's crazy spending time up there because you learn to use the role of the land yep. in a different way than if you've hunted brush country. Yeah. yeah. You you don't know it's there. That, that You don't know that that topography is available like to cows. you. Yep. But you got to be willing to get on your belly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's, there's two situations at play uh, down there right now that um, – when I when I was there, and I'd been there years ago, um, hunted Alberta. I think uh, I've done it three times, and then this. Each time, back in 2016, 17, there were so many deer. Yes, I was so, there. I think in seventeen, right after you guys were. Yeah. What I what I noticed uh, the hard part, the hardest part, one of the hardest part, and I told this to Pedro. I'm like, man, the last time I was there, the hardest part is there's so many does. There's, there's just so many deer Yep, deer that to general. get to the one you want, there's like 20 deer between you and like, they're just landmines everywhere. Everywhere. Now <clears throat> they've had a bout with CWD there. The, uh, like most mule deer populations across the West, it's, it's struggling up there too, yep. as well as, as, uh, in the lower 48, there's some pockets where they do well, but winter kill was really bad last year in a lot of areas out West this happens and the mule deer population up there right now is struggling. And so there, the density of deer was so much lower. Yep. So in one sense, it was, he, that became a positive, that became a positive. That's yep. what I was going to, because yep. it was so hard to get in. Now there's fewer deer, but when you do find one, it's kind of just him and a couple does. Yeah. It's him and a couple of does, and you're not messing. You're not on the Wasatch front mm-hmm. playing combat bow hunting. <laughs> right. You're the only one. It's you and him, and so it's just everything slows down. You can be very conscious of the decisions. If he's not in a great spot, let him be. Yeah. No one else is going to go after him. You could be very, very careful and calculated in how yeah. you went about getting in these deer. Well, in open country, it's yes, it's hard, but there's always two good things about open country. You can see, one, yep. and two – Usually the wind is blowing. Usually the wind blows almost every day. And and it was here. And the other advantage, again, to open country. So right as you were leaving, Brian, that storm was blowing in. So the first day we were there, it was just windy, ground was dry, and then it snowed like four or five Hmm. inches that night. Yeah. Kept coming on. Very windy, very, very cold. And the negatives, obviously spotting mule deer in the snow is very, very easy. And so so again, that open terrain now just added another layer of visibility because these deer stick out like a turd in a punch bowl, mm-hmm. right? Like, man, there's a black dot on the hill. <laughs> yeah, I bet you it's a deer yeah. where before, if, yeah. if you didn't know, you probably wouldn't have seen that deer. And so, I mean, it really upped the visibility. Um, and that, that ended up kind of being part of his, his demise at the end of the day. Let's talk about the, how you got the buck. Yeah. Um, I think, that I, I'm trying, I'll try not to interrupt. I'll let you tell the whole story because <laughs> I'm an interrupter and it drives people crazy. So I'll just let you tell the story, but then I want to, I want to ask sort of the, I want to break it down a little bit mm-hmm. in terms of, um, lessons that we can all learn from this. Cause I'm always trying to get better. And part of this, just this story. And the reason I want to know about experiences like this, cause I want to be able to 
achieve the same success in the same situation, you know, um, and it's, it's, you know, I could say, Matt, you see a buck in a meadow light. What is your step one, two, three, four, five, six, how to do it. (laughs) But what I'd rather do is just tell me what did happen. And then let's break that down a little bit. How you executed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll first say there's always plenty of luck in that before I go into the story. (laughs) But um, so, yeah, I mean, I I mentioned that Josh and Jeff and I had found this deer and Jeff had actually spotted the deer. So initially it was like, hey, you guys flip a coin. This is kind of our group's deer. We found this deer. Um, Guiding is usually a two on one out Uh there. Mm -hmm. And so Jeff was with Josh and I. So it's like, okay, we flipped a coin. Josh won. We went on in on that first opportunity. Um, I'm set up behind Josh. When the deer was up on the hill, I said, do you want to go around? What do you want to do? He said, no, you go around. Um, so anyways, that was essentially kind of Josh's yeah. turn or whatever. Um, next day, tried finding the deer, couldn't find him. Well, no, uh, Brian and Matt, because we showed him the video, they're like, dude, that's an incredible deer. These are big parcels of ground. We'll set up on one side. You guys go on another. Let's see if we can find this deer. They end up spotting the deer. He ends up moving into somewhere where we can't see him. We're not going to push the issue, right? We want to get eyes on him. So we go fart around. I actually stalked another deer uh, where Josh actually killed his deer, which that ended up paying off, but um, didn't really have any luck on that particular stock. The deer just weren't there by the time I got in there. Next day, well, a couple days, I guess, have gone by. Um, We've gone in after this deer twice, I believe, and just... No, no good opportunities, essentially. Um, Weather was cold. Oh, man. It was it was glass from the truck type stuff. When you're, you're just... sneaking around bow hunting in your puffy gear, you know it's cold. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, it, I mean, very limited time outside of the truck. It was just a cold that, uh, I mean, I'm from Utah. I'm from Heber. You know, we get cold here, mm-hmm. but that was, it was just, it was different. It was different Windy. for sure. Um, okay. So anyways, it, I think it was... By this point, it gets to, I think it was Friday. Yeah, it would have been Friday. And um, Brian, um, you know, we haven't turned the buck up. We haven't had luck. And it's kind of like, Brian, like, like super grateful you're helping us try to find this deer. It's like, but dude, go hunt. Like, there's there's more deer and stuff. Like, don't just dedicate your hunt to this. Super gracious of him to come help. But, like, go hunt too. Like, you've got mm-hmm. a tag in your pocket as well. So, anyways, they, they go hunt. Um, Friday morning and that morning we find the deer that have been hanging with this deer and we're moving all around. And I mean, you're kind of limited on and that's the, you and, uh, uh, Josh and Josh, Josh is helping you now. Yep. Cause he tagged out. Well, he hadn't tagged out yet. Oh, okay. So this is, this is, uh, yeah, so you guys Friday really morning. didn't get Jack done for a while. <laughs> Dude, it was, you were bird hunting, you liar. <laughs> <laughs> I, did shoot a lot. I shot a lot of birds. <laughs> <laughs> and I was loving it. I was totally <laughs> fine. I was totally, I almost took a dog. I'm glad I didn't because it's cold. But anyways, there's a little bit of bird hunting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Poking yeah. around. Um, anyways, so we find the deer that's with this deer. Can't turn him up. Mm-hmm. Like I said, this deer, he would just lay down. All the other deer would be up. You'd see other deer. And dude, he would just lay there. So this mm-hmm. So this is a Friday? Friday morning. Jeez. Friday morning. We've so got you guys have been hunting Saturday. since Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So this is Friday morning. Friday morning. And no one's tagged out. No shots. <laughs> Very few stocks. Okay. Thanks. I didn't realize. For some reason, I thought things happened sooner. But No, it was, okay. it was all like at once. And zero, <laughs> zero to hero. You're done on Saturday evening. Saturday evening, that's the last day. I mean, it's, it's illegal it, to hunt on Sunday. It's illegal yep. to hunt on Sunday. And Jeff's out of there. Yeah, he's <laughs> yeah. Like I said, he's been he's been on the mountain or in the field for a long time. So Saturdays, that's that's the deadline. It's the same same thing I experienced. Like I said before, mm-hmm. when I when I shot that other deer and shot mm-hmm. him tall in no man's land, we went to look on Sunday, but he was just out feeding in the field. I couldn't go try and stalk him and yep. shoot him again. You know, it was over. Yeah. Um. So Friday morning, find the other deer that with are with this deer can't find him uh we get a call from b mac and b max found a deer and he's trying to size it up trying to figure it out b mac has been super gracious to us it's like well nothing's happening here right now we'll come back and try to find this buck later we've looked and looked and looked and looked he's either got to get up and get in a new bed or something's got to give but Mm -hmm. we're just standing here 
just Wasting looking. Time. So yeah. let's go around. So we go to drive around, and out there, there are these big, giant parcels. I don't know how many miles they are, but it's just all broken up by these dirt roads. And we've had so much snow that some of the roads are impassable. You can't get through them. Uh, Cliff got his got his car stuck one time. We had to go find a farmer to pull him out. It was, <laughs> that, that was probably like all day Wednesday. I'm pretty sure that's what we did Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, as we're driving around to go find BMAC and help him, Josh is sitting shotgun and he spots a deer. And it's like in the exact same spot that I'd been in like two days before mm. trying to get that buck. I'm like, dude, I know right how to get on there. Isn't that so powerful? Like oh when you made a stock on a certain bed and you're like, you're like, if I could do that again, I, I'd, I'd crush it. Cause now I know all the ins and outs. I, I mean, what, yeah. It, and it, it, it did pay off big time because there was one particular bed that when I had gone in there the first time before I had seen a buck in there mm -hmm. and he saw me and those other deer had moved off by that time, but I knew I'm like, we have to check that bed because that bed can, will see us if we're up on the hill. Mm -hmm. Sure as crap. As we tiptoed, there was a buck laying in that bed. So I'm like, we got to go all the way around this way. Anyways, we got around, we were right above the deer. There were three bucks there and Josh is right behind me. I've got a range finder and I'm just ranging the side of this hill. I'm like, dude, it's like 40 yards. Like that deer is here. And I'm like looking at his sight and he's got 20, 30, 40. I'm like, all right, dude, we're, yeah. and I'm like, draw your bow. Uh -huh. We're going to stand up together and I'm going to give you a range. <clears throat> and we stand up and the, there's these two smaller bucks in the bottom and they turn to look at us and I can see the other buck that were, that we ended up shooting that we were there for. He's asleep. Head in the freaking dirt, dude. Jeez. Just, <laughs> I mean, just zonked out. It was, it was actually pretty sunny that day, ironically. Um, still cold. Anyways, those deer kind of bound, and Josh can't see him just where he's at. I know he's going to be able to see this deer, and the deer stands up, and I just say 20, because I know it's freaking top pin, and yeah. dude, he freaking just gulp. I mean, really? just front stuff this deer. <laughs> he's shooting the Valkyrie system as yeah. well. Coast to coast, dude. Shot all the way through that deer, and that deer ran like 80 yards and died. And, I mean, it, you would have thought we just won the Super Bowl. It was pretty exciting, <laughs> That's it was awesome. pretty exciting you know. Because that was his first mule deer. That was his first mule. His first, like, legit stock on a mule deer, and he shoots this, like, 170 buck. It's, it's a beautiful a, it's deer. It's a cool deer. The eye guards are, like, yeah. flames. Anyways, really cool deer. Anyway, so right before that, I got to back up a little bit because this is important. So right before that, as we're, like, getting on this deer – Brian's decided that he doesn't want to go after this other deer from what I understand. So Brian was driving to come past us. He was trying to come to Jeff, who Jeff was watching us. Jeff mm -hmm. was our guide. And he's going to drive on this road that's, it's far enough away, but those deer are just so cagey. So why risk it? So Jeff says, Hey, you need to turn around and go all the way around. Cause you're going to drive within a couple hundred yards of these guys, essentially. Yeah. Um, and so Brian turns to go around and as Brian's coming around, this deer had repositioned and they saw the deer. So they find the deer. We've already killed this other deer. Um, Josh, Josh uh, FaceTimes Brian and Brian's like, we found the buck. He's in an incredible position. We're going in. And so it's like, we got this deer, drag him out. Cause I want to go watch dude. I'm like, yeah. Oh my gosh, this is super exciting. You know, like. Man, he's finally in a good spot. Hopefully, someone gets him. Just want to put eyes on him again. I just want you know to what see I mean? Just to see thing. these Goliaths, you know, these <laughs> unicorns. So, so you hurry over. So we we get his, we gutted his deer, drug it to the road. Josh's deer. Josh's uh -huh. deer. Yep. Um, threw it in the back of Cliff's Cliff's truck. And <laughs> this is all on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> this is all Friday. I mean, it's like one o'clock yeah. basically. Yeah. Um, we drive around. And so we're, we're cruising. We're, we're going to get, we know where those guys are at. They have, they've started to make their approach. We're coming from the other side and we're like pulling up to where we had seen those deer before, dude. And plain as day, dude, here's, the, and you can see him from like a mile away and he's buried in this hole Jeez. to us. Yeah. And it's just like, it's just big freaking crater. His backs against like this little like embankment, like, dude, he's buried mm. and it's freaking you can just see his horn sticking up above the brush and it's like the most incredible opportunity to stalk a deer like that like mm -hmm. brian got the win brian made an awesome stock and got up right behind him brian's kind of like sitting there and 
this deer the whole time again he's looking at us the first time we saw him he's locked on us like he's mm-hmm. he can tell something's up you know he sees a truck or whatever mm-hmm. we're a long ways away and uh anyways this you know i'm watching through my binos and sure as crap dude this buck stands up and he's looking at us and it's like oh my gosh like i see the buck start moving his head and i'm looking through 15 Power, yeah, and I see Brian draw his bow, and I just watch this deer stand up. And dude, like I've got goosebumps just thinking about <laughs> it. Dude, like oh. the pinnacle of bow hunting. Yeah, like, this is it, dude. And anyway, see the deer bolt, and you can tell that Brian has shot. The deer goes running, and he kind of dis- disappears behind this hill, and I don't see him come out. And I'm like, holy cow, dude! He freaking got him! Like, it. Holy cow, man! Like exciting right this is exciting and all of a sudden you just see this deer and he's you know there's just enough topography that i mean he probably never stopped running yeah but dude he is just motoring up this mountain and there's a couple fences in there and just boom one fence boom boom just jumping these fences <laughs> that's like, so oh. discouraging <laughs> yeah <laughs> he's supposed to be tipped over <laughs> right, i saw like, oh, wait, so, this isn't like with pedro and i we experienced a thing like that and you're just like yeah he ain't dead you know, you're just like, you're watching it. You're just like, uh, uh. Pedro, he fell on the ground and just <laughs> started. <laughs> if you've bow hunted, you've been there. You're like, please yeah. fall over. Please fall over. Please right. fall over. <laughs> and then you, you, after a few fences, you're like, yeah, no, he's good. He's, he's, he's pretty, pretty good. Over. I mean, he could be hurt, but it's like, you know, when you, when you punch a lung or you hit a, uh, you know, you know, they fall down. They don't go very far. Yeah. When you hit them right, they're dead, dead. Yeah. So yeah. something didn't go right. You knew it. Yeah. Some, so, so, could some, you tell that was he bleeding? Not could that, you see it? Not that we could see from our distance. Okay. No. You from couldn't our, really tell something had happened. Mm-mm. No, couldn't so tell. Did you? Did were, at that point? Did you think he got hit, or did you think he got missed? We, we had no point? idea. Yeah. Honestly, you could kind of tell by their body language. It was kind of like something's off. Like mm-hmm. the, you know, it's like you shoot a buck like that. You're probably going to be a little fist pumping, right. and happy, high five, and hugging. And they're kind of, you can just kind of tell they're just kind of just sitting there like talking. Yeah. And it's like, oh, like something Didn't went awry. Right. Yeah. But at the same time, the steer's still where we can hunt him. And this buck ends up doing this giant loop. And we watch, and he goes into some brush. Cliff sees him. So Brian and those guys make their way over to us. And it's kind of just like, we don't know what happened. Mm. Like you the, got video though. They have video, but they haven't blown it up on the big okay. screen. He's just looking at yeah. his little screen, and, and like you can tell that the deer ducks. The deer absolutely right. ducks. When I edit video, and I'm showing people the in the field, right? We're like, I, I wouldn't. That moose is he's, he's less than sixty inches. He's got to be, or like you you see something happen, you're like, oh, he's he missed him, but he didn't. You know? Oh yeah. Because we're looking at it as a dot through our cameras. <laughs> And then it's not on a sixty inch plasma. Yeah. No. Then I get home and I blow it up into <laughs> slow a, it down for a four K slow motion, uh, blown up, and and it's like we look like idiots. We're like, we're I don't. He's not an inch over one fifty, and he's like one hundred seventy <laughs> inches. You're like, because what we're looking at is just a fat gas, and but what the viewer gets to see in post is so brilliant and perfect. But Absolutely. that's not what you're looking at. Just like yeah. this book. You got so many extras that you don't see in the field in the moment through a pair of 12 or 15 power binos. No. Like even you don't through, see it. Even through a spotting scope, it was just like, at, at a point you realize it's like, that's just a giant, giant deer. deer. I don't care what little whatever. Right. Like, well, and, uh, <laughs> and I was thinking this earlier, I didn't say it, but I've seen 180, 185 inch bucks that look bigger than this. Absolutely. Right? Because the, the way they splay out and lay open and mm-hmm. go up. So looks aren't the same as inches no. uh, like we we threw out rust scores and i said i my personal guess of the deer was low 180s that was my personal guess yeah and jeff was like high 170s he was like we're, we were all right probably around that 180, 180 mark. mark but again you're just you're not seeing yeah. the whole thing and tape mm-hmm. measure told it a completely different story uh, which i mean it doesn't if it was 180 inch, I, uh, I also be. don't <laughs> care. Right? Like, Me neither, right? Like Lampers will say, you know, if it speaks to you, then that's yeah. it. If it gets you excited, then that's the one. Oh, yeah. And I've got lots of 150s and 160s and 170s that I was just as excited to shoot yeah. as yeah, I was right. this one. I, yeah. I just want to get excited about it. So, um, so anyways, um, we weren't able to get the deer. 
um, that evening. So we, hey, you we, looked at it though that night and you could see where the shot was later. You couldn't tell. You still uh. couldn't tell where the deer was. Cause he dropped down. You saw an, the arrow on the opposite side, like flip up at like a weird angle. And I don't know. He shot it on its left side. Um, yeah, he shot it on its left side mm-hmm. and you could see like the arrow on the left side as it was kind of going away. So was it kind of quartering away too? Uh, I think it was perfectly, his head was turned. His, I could see I, that. I think he was perfectly broadside yeah, to him. Okay. He may have been. Um, I, I just remember him just standing up and thinking, "Oh my gosh, <laughs> like wow, look at that thing." Yeah. Um, but you could hear it, listening to the audio. You could hear his arrow hit brush. Absolutely, mm. he shot through some brush. Okay. Um, and the deer ducked, and I would imagine the deer was ducking based off the arrow coming mm-hmm. through the brush. Um, so, I mean, in, in our head, we're thinking. Either uh, you knew it got hit though. Yeah, uh, we 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 believe the deer's been hit. Um, I think Brian mentioned that multiple times in in that blog, just saying like I hit the deer, it's been wounded. It's obviously not lethal. The deer isn't dead. Mm-hmm. Like, but we don't know where we've hit it because there's no conclusive evidence in film or and through our own eyesight. So the 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 one that in open country like that, the worst for me, the worst is the shot forward. Mm-hmm. It. It's like I always nowadays as I've been hunting a lot longer and I say this on my podcast all the time, you know, when I'm hunting bears, it's middle of middle, right? Absolutely. I'm going middle of middle and you have to tell guys that cause they lose, we killed so many bears at this point. You lose so many bears by shooting too far forward. First mm-hmm. of all, their lungs and everything are back anyway. Right. Correct. Right. And they and got, got that shoulder, massive and bone up, front. all that stuff up front, the, the body tissue. And people are just so used to look for the crease and then aiming up that and shooting. And on a bear, that's really not the, where you want to put that bullet. But also, you know, when you go middle of middle, when it's a black blob, that helps too. Because it's for hard sure. to find where the front shoulder is and da 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 Absolutely. But over time, I found, Matt, when I have a habit of aiming, going up the leg and going in the crease like in your head as you shoot 3d and you do tack and you do all this kind of yep. stuff. I stopped. I started just splitting the animal in half. And then I started moving my, my pin toward the shoulder in yep. a little bit because I have found that I've lost a number of animals because I don't give myself any margin of error on, on the, on the, on one whole side of the shot. Right. Because yep. if you are aiming for that crease, you got like your three inches or four inches on, let's say, let's say it's the same direction. So let's say the head is to the left and you aim at that crease. You have like 18, 20 inches to the right. And you got like five to the left, three. I use percentages, right? Like that's just how my mind works. And I'm like, percentage wise, there's what? 10% of the vitals that are within a certain distance of that crease. Mm -hmm. And then the other 90% are back. Yes. Plus, Guts. I mean, no, you're not. You don't want to. You're not trying to gut shoot an animal. But if you do gut shoot an animal in open country, you're probably going to get him. Yeah. Yep. Whether right. you like it, like, and I'm not. I'm not advocating that. I'm just saying. But that is a reality. Right. Having killed animals, because I've experienced the same thing. I've lost two bull elk and that mule deer in Alberta, shooting them tall through no man's land. If I'd shot towards the rear a couple inches, yes. I probably would have shot well, the top it, of the lungs. It's like the old saying, like, don't hit the pole. What do you do? You walk and you hit the pole. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah exactly. You know? But you said something that I think is a different conversation for another time, but it's, it's, it's the culture of archery and 3d shoots and where the 10 ring is, where the 12, where those yes. score rings are. And it's just like, dude, I'll take a center eight yes. every day. And yeah. that's, you look at my 3d target in my backyard, the lungs of it are shot out. I don't even look at the, I'm not even trying mm-hmm. to shoot the crease. The lungs of the animal are shot out. And years that's where ag- I aim. Years ago, I stopped doing the scoring. It, it, and then even this last year when we went to TAC, when I was with Greg Ritz the yeah. year before and this year, yeah. we've had this conversation. I'm like, Greg, I, I shoot for kills, like legit kill shots. And I try to reinforce that habit because I found myself aiming for 12 rings and 10 rings and whatever. And then I'd go out in the field and go, but in the field, I'll do different than I practice all the time. Nope. And then I no, default you- right into this habit where, why would I put the arrow there? Yep. I would never, that's a yep. stupid spot. So now I start aiming for exits in my head. Yep. Where are those exits at? 
and I and I'm aiming for that kill. Yep. And when you start doing that, you become, I think, a lot more deadly in the field because too often the habit and the culture of aiming for those creases mm-hmm. costs you. So you think about it. Let's say you went, you aim for the middle of the body, just a little bit forward, so your back of the lungs are a little bit. If you do go right, your liver, your diaphragm, mm-hmm. your then you get into the guts. In open country, it's a dead deer. Absolutely, one hundred percent dead deer. It's not. It's not timber. I mean, you got snow on the ground. Right. You got all this stuff. Like, and I'm a lot more like center mass aiming Me too. when I'm in open country on the snow. Like we were hunting late season, right? I'm like, dude, I'm putting it center mass, and I'm, my goal is to get that deer. I'm going to try to make the perfect shot, but yeah, if if it goes left right, I'm still in the money. Yep, yep. When you aim in that front quadrant, like you were saying, percentages the T. You better you better not pull it left, you or, or be you a better sniper. You better dude. be like <laughs> you better and be I, a sniper. I think that that is a. That is a mistake that uh, too many of us, I mean, I lost a number of elk this way, like three where they didn't die, but I didn't kill them. You know what I mean? Like yeah. uh, I, I hit them right through the shoulder, both shoulders. It's like freaking A, man. And then I shot tall, but right behind that crease, no man's land, 16 yards. And it's like, I had the whole, like in, in 90% <laughs> of space it's I could have shot board. it. You got to hit a And I'm board. like putting it right there because it's a habit. So I had to start changing my practice routine so it would translate into the real world. I think Corey Jacobson said it best, but he said, center of liver kills him good. (laughs) (laughs) It's true. And it's just like, dude, I mean, vitals are vitals. Yeah. Give yourself a margin of error. Now that said, in like, uh, you know, hunting bears with uh, Lander or being in uh, dense cover, Oregon coast, uh, sick of blacktail, in some of those places, I want them dumped and dumped within 50 yards. Yeah. hundred. Like, they Damn will them. disappear. And if they don't bleed well, like, yeah, you just gave it a death sentence shooting too far back. Yeah. So, in those situations, I might use an expandable. And I, and I, might, yeah. and I might actually – and I'm definitely aiming forward because I need them to dump. Because if you shoot them too far back, we're not talking open country in the snow now. Yep. If it runs 500 yards, it's gone. Yep. If it runs 100 yards, it might you be might gone. Lose it, yeah. And so in that case, I'm using different tools for that job, and I'm taking different shots for that occasion. And I think you got to think about all that stuff totally. in your game plan. You got you to play out the coulda, woulda, shouldas, and, yep. and go through that whole process and set an expectation for what's going to happen. Yeah. Well, no matter what, like you're always trying for the perfect shot, no matter what. Absolutely. You're but, not trying to make I mean, that, that's our goal. Mm-hmm. But then again, it's like your, your goal end goal is to get that animal. And I, the thing is, that's 100% true. And what I'm looking for is the most forgiveness yeah, I can too. achieve. Right, forgiveness. I, I want it to go exactly where I'm aiming, mm-hmm. but I know that my nerves, my my adrenaline, the wind, like all these factors play a role. So it's like, give myself more margin of error by choosing a better aiming point. Yep, you know, yep. Sa- same with uh, you know, I was shooting from a lot of animals from tree stands when I lived in Oregon, and that really helped me uh, later when I lost a couple of giant blacktail bucks. Because I wasn't aiming for exit holes. You get in there and you get in your head. And I was a young archer at the time. And I'm like, heart lungs. Dude, when the animals, when you're shooting at an angle, <laughs> right. like, don't aim for the heart and lungs. Like, like, like the actual entry point there, it needs to, it needs to enter here. like back here and near the, the hip. Out the yeah. and, the and it's just like this habit of, I shot exactly how I shoot all these targets, but not accounting for angle. And when you get adrenaline anyway. Yep. But yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's a, it's a culture. It's like practice how you hunt. I guess like in my mind, like that's what I'm thinking when I'm go- setting up my equipment, I'm trying to make sure I know it as thoroughly as possible, dialing in, figuring out what are my margin of errors yeah. and then accounting for that going into those situations on an individual basis. Yeah. And, and by the way, I'm not criticizing BMAC shot. I'm just no, saying no, where, no. where it hit it's so far forward that, um, and you don't know like what it deflected off of. I was in Alberta and one of the bucks I shot, um, the arrow hit like seven branches on the way there and then miss hit the deer and it just fell out. And, but, but 
that's easy to do. It just takes one branch and then it's, it's yeah. completely deflected. So over. not saying that I'm just saying like, when you look yeah. at it, be aware of shooting too far forward. Um, that that's, that's a soup. That's the one shot. I'm like, Oh no, not that shot. Not that mm-hmm. shot. Because if it had been back in the liver, in the guts, in the diaphragm, it's like dead deer. We just got to find it. Yep. Yeah. We just got to keep eyes. We got to track it. Maybe now while it's in the snow, but forward like that, you better just, leave that sucker alone and try to find him the next day. Yep. Uh, hope he bled out. So, yep. yeah. So you guys didn't find the deer that night that B-Max shot it then? No, no, we didn't find him. So we ended up, we drove around to the other side, came in to kind of where they last saw him, cut his tracks. Um, I don't know if the coyotes were on, were following him. That was a, a concern that Jeff had put. He's like, dude, like, yeah. if he's hit bad enough, there's coyotes out there, mm-hmm. right? Um, Those and coyotes were, are the worst, dude. Oh, dude! Next time we go up there, I ha- I'm buying a permit and taking a gun. I bet you we could have shot thirty dogs. <laughs> yeah, like out, like off the side of the. That's road all Pedro there. wanted to do. <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. They're yeah. everywhere. Um, but anyway, so this deer ended up, and he did bed down at one point. Um, obviously blood in it. You know, it's like he's razor sharp broadheads. They're gonna bleed. Yeah, but. Snow definitely accentuates and makes things a little bit more mm-hmm. dramatic than sure. what they are. There was, you know, periodic drops of blood in the snow as he would bound or run. Um, clean razor cut's going to do that. Mm-hmm. I think that's p- part of it. So you didn't know what had happened, but but uh, but there was still a piece of the arrow in it. We didn't know there was a piece of arrow in the deer. But there was. There was. We didn't know that until I killed yep. the deer. Um, so BMAC never found his arrow arrow. He did. He found his other piece. So we okay. knew he like, that's where we were like saying, okay, we think there might be a piece of arrow in yep. him and we could have prob- passed through though. could have broken off on the other side, fallen mm-hmm. out. Like lots of things could happen. Yep. Was Number the blade three. in him or just the center of the arrow? The blade, the broadhead was still in him. Okay. okay. The broadhead was lodged in the top of the, um, the offside, offside shoulder. scapula. So what I think happened talking about deflection, cause the, it came through the brush. I think the mm-hmm. buck, this, this is uh, I'm not a scientist or anything, but I'm just saying <laughs> hypothetically, this is what I believe based on what I saw. Arrow came through the brush, deer ducked, and because the arrow was up taller than the entry hole mm-hmm. on the opposite side. It was up very yeah. very tall in the offside shoulder. And so I think it was kind of on its way up. Was he shooting like a mega meat? Do you know what? No, he, he was shooting a Valkyrie. Oh, system. he was Valkyrie. Yeah, okay. he was shooting a Valkyrie brought it. He was shooting the vented, the 180 vented. Yeah, okay. Um, anyway, so... We don't find the deer that night, but we realize he's just done a giant loop, and he's headed right back to where he freaking came from. Smart <laughs> buck, <dude. laughs> yeah, smart smart. buck, dude. So, anyways, go back, watch the film. Um, you know, celebrate Josh's buck. He just killed his first mule deer. Epic, epic stock. What a kill. Um, watch the film, and we're like, okay, here's our game plan. We're gonna we're gonna come in. This deer is is has been basically isolating himself to this big canyon and it's you know two miles long but yeah. there's just all these rolls of these fingers these dips patches of red brush great spot to be a deer and hide and this is the last day of the season last day of the season this is saturday morning so we kind of do our standard let's just see if we can find the deer mm-hmm. so we glass and look glass and look and then we decide okay you guys brian and matt are going to go get on his tracks where we left him because you say last day of your hunt last day of the hunt thank you yeah. um and then just start following the tracks Mm-hmm. And I'm going to come in from the other side. And because there's just so much topography, you be on one side of the canyon, I'll Glass be on the other. back and forth. Let's, let's work all these angles together and just progress our way throughout, um, throughout the canyon. And the buck was in the last spot that we looked. And they spotted him. And the deer, ironically, was... Was that Josh? Uh, no, Matt and Brian. Oh, okay. So they spotted it all the way across, but the deer was right below me. The deer was probably within 80 yards, just okay. down off this last little finger. I was up on this bench by this big, uh, I don't know if it was a, a Milo field or a flax field. And then it just dumped down into all these little fingers. You were clearing that canyon. We were just clearing the canyon. Yeah. And they spotted the deer. I was set up by the deer and um, Brian wanted another crack on him, which is awesome. And so Brian made a giant loop and came all the way around. Uh, we met up. We ended up sitting there for two hours, probably. Really? Yeah. Um, we knew there were some other deer that were right by him. And so we were kind of hoping that they would feed off. And so we're just sitting there just you know, walking in circles. I mean, doing uh-huh. push-ups, doing everything. You stay can, warm. <laughs> try and stay warm. I mean, you got all your puffy stuff on. I've got a bunch of wool. Um, just for the occasion, but you're still cold. Yeah. <laughs> 
And finally we're like, okay, you know, these deer I think are, are moving off. Um, and we decide that we're going to go in and Brian's like, oh, do you want to, do you want to come in with me? Like have an arrow knocked, like I'll shoot first if, if we can get another arrow in him. Like at this point, like, you know, Brian articulated it perfectly, but it's just like, we need to bring this deer home, right? Yeah. Like yeah. at this point, we know the deer's been hit. It's the last day. It's the last afternoon. It's like probably three o'clock is when this stock probably started. And Brian does a great job. Brian is so patient. Like, dude, he is like, he's sneaky. He's a sneaky <laughs> dude. I got to give it to him. And dude, he freaking got right up on that buck. And I was like, dude, you just got to go in. I'm not going to come in next to you, knock an arrow, anything right. like that, you know? And, um, I, I see him get all situated. I see him range a couple times, knocks an arrow. I see him kind of mess with his sight and I see him draw his bow and then slowly kind of get up, like raise up on his knees and he's kneeling and dude, he's at full draw for like over a minute. Yeah. You can watch folks that are listening to the podcast. Yeah. You can go to the Hush uh, YouTube channel and you can watch the video. Yep. And there's a clock actually, I think, in the <laughs> yeah. corner yeah. Yep. that's just showing how it's a long time. I didn't know in the video. I wasn't sure why uh, why he was why the clock was running. Yeah. Like what was what was the problem there? He didn't quite have the shot. There was too much brush. I, I think he wasn't comfortable with the shot. I'm not sure what okay. all Brian could see. I think in the video they uh, it was kind of head and neck. Mm -hmm. um, again, we don't know how bad this deer is hurt. Mm -hmm. We right. have no idea. Like we followed like little. You don't know if he's like going to die in the next hour or if he's like good to go for a week. Right. So I think in Brian's mind, he's he's gauging. He's trying to weigh his odds. Do I send a non-optimal arrow and to try it's to the get last it. day? Like, do, what, what do I do here? So and and so I think Brian's mentally going through that process and he's at full draw, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not the time to be thinking about <laughs> yeah, stuff right. or making decisions. Anyways, um, he's at full draw for forever and major props to him. I couldn't have done that. And um, he decided he wanted to get, a, I think, see a little bit more of the body. And so he goes to stand up and you can see that in the video. He goes to get off his knee, he raises the one knee and he starts coming up. And I don't know if the other deer saw him and ran and that made him bolt or what, but um, obviously deer stands up, runs, uh, and Brian shoots at the deer and unfortunately doesn't connect with mm -hmm. it. And it runs down, it stops. And uh, where are you? Are you up? I'm probably thirty yards behind Brian. Okay. I'm, I'm pretty close. Okay, but I'm like I'm out of sight. I've got yeah. my phone. I'm trying to video and you know help out with the vlog. If I can't, yeah. I'm a horrible <laughs> videographer. <laughs> for my crappy little iPhone. Here you go, guys. <laughs> trying to help, I guess. Yeah. Um. Anyway, so uh, this deer takes off, and um, I can tell Brian's upset. I think anybody would be. And, I think he threw uh, his bow in the, <laughs> in the video, <laughs> and. Uh, Anyway, so he, he goes to look for his arrow. Well, when the deer takes off, in my mind, I'm like, well, dude, we still got a little bit of light. So I actually run past Brian on the ridge, and I watch the buck run, and he goes up this draw, and kind of in the same direction that he ran. Uh, escape route he escape, used before. Uh, escape route that he used before when Brian first hit him. And at this point, like when, when he got up and ran, like we could see that there was some blood on the top of his shoulder, and that, was on, that would have been on the side that he got shot on, on his left side. Um, but deer runs, jumps two or three fences and he's leaving country basically. Mm -hmm. Um, anyways, come back. I wanted to see where the deer went, hoping for an opportunity at him. Come back, look for Brian's arrow a little bit. Um, after seeing, you know, David Brinker and, and, uh, South right. Cox encounters with, uh, broadheads, I wasn't going <laughs> to poke around in the brush <laughs> looking for a, a sharp Valkyrie too yeah. long. Um, so we ended up kind of just regrouping right there. Um, and all went back to the rig. And the plan was we're going to drive around. Um, we know a general area that this deer has gone into. And there's maybe hour and a half, two hours of legal light left. Like now it's fourth quarter. You yeah. Know? It's, it's down to the wire. Um, so we drive around and Brian and I, we're going to go in together. And so we walk in and um, after Brian had shot at the deer, um, it, kind of just expressed he said man you know thanks for letting me come stalk the deer again you know let's let's get this deer done like let's just get this deer we had a fist bump 
it was it was my turn to go yeah. after this deer, right? You guys just need to get this poor suffering buck on the ground. Like, who kills it? I'm I'm kind of. My wife was like, <laughs> "Somebody needs to kill that deer." When she was watching that video, <laughs> and we're kind of feeling the same way, right? Yeah. I mean, obviously, it's it's a beautiful deer. It's a very big deer. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, it deserves to to come home. Yeah. You know, on that trip. Anyway, so we go in, and the plan was. I mean, this buck the day before or whatever, it just ran a giant loop. It's like, man, there's a really good chance he does that. So it's like, Brian, you go down and mm-hmm. kind of just see if he, if he, if I comes I, back around, if like I, last if, time. if I bump him or something yeah. like that, like yeah. let's be in this escape route. Right. Anyways, I go in and like, you're feeling this pressure. Cause it's like, you're trying to hurry. Cause there's only so much time, but you got to go slow. Yeah. Like the topography, everything we talked about, it rolls so slow. It One step exposes so much, right? Yeah. I always say this, you know, I, one of the things I hate is when, when you're going in on something and you're with a hunter and he's like, he's probably not there anyway. And so yeah, he's man. like, so he just starts like moving in. And it's like, mm-hmm. dude, if you're gonna do it, do it right. Yeah. yeah you better act like that deer is there unless you saw him leave. He's there. He's there and treat it like he's there or don't even bother. Cause all you're going to do is bump, blow him yeah, out. You're going to blow him out. And that takes some mental discipline because when I was younger, I'd be like, I just wasn't, I wouldn't piece it apart, pick it apart inch by inch as I moved, as I moved in after yeah. something, I'd just be like, well, he's probably not in this pocket anyway. So I'm going to push through this pocket I, I to get, get to, to the, the next, next pocket yeah. and you're just blowing stuff out. And then you step on him. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but you're, 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 but you're risking that uh, you'll run out of hours in daylight before you get to the pocket where he's at. But that's the deal. That's the, it doesn't, the thing is, is if he is right there, you have to act like it. You, yep. It's, it's. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's, that's, you're kind of going through this mental battle, right? So it's like, you want to physically charge in there, but it's like, I'm just trying to go, I'm like, just do it right, dude. Even if you, even if you don't find the deer, at least you went about it in the right way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, that's what I'm trying to tell myself. Anyways, I end up finding the deer, smart little turd, winds blowing over the top of his back and he's looking down into this big draw. So I just walk this big loop. I probably get within maybe 80 to 90 yards from him and the wind kind of switches. And then I just see him. I just, I'm all of a sudden I see him just walking away. And at this point I'm like, I just kind of crouch down and walk him. I'm like, dude, I've got nothing to lose. I'm not letting this deer out of my sight. Yeah. And as soon as he rounds over this hill, dude, I just take off freaking running. I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to run this deer down. Right. In my head, I'm like, okay, you know, we've seen some blood. Like is the broadhead in him? Mm Mm-hmm. Is there a chance can that I make I, it worse? Can I make it worse? Right. Mm-hmm. And some people probably hear that and they think, God, that's like horrific. But what's more horrific, losing the deer and it dying anyways, or at least a right. long, slow death or a quicker one, especially right. in open country. Like you're not going to lose the deer. You can see. Exactly. So I, I, I mean, see. and it was just a decision I made, whether that was right or wrong. That was the decision. I well, made you said earlier, moment. it takes a little bit of luck. It takes a little bit of luck. And it's a decision you made. And this time it was more of a lucky one because it could have been like, see ya, man. Yeah, he could have, <laughs> yeah, he could have, he could have boogied out. And so anyways, he ends up running. I mean, at this point, I, I don't know if he saw me or whatever, but this deer finally decides he's running. He's, he's going to boogie. And ironically, basically runs into, and this was again, luck. These guys are sitting down on this one end glassing. We're trying to find the deer. Anyways, he basically runs into that rig, sees the rig, and turns and comes right back. I mean, this deer just ran like a couple miles. I'm catching glimpses of him. I'm just seeing him just going over the hill, you know, and I'm just running, dude. I'm in puffy pants, like a woltimate coat, a down vest, like, like, dude, and I'm just, I'm falling in the snow, you know. I'm like running as fast as I can, just tripping and falling and sweating. I'm, I'm drenched in sweat, dude, drenched in sweat, running after this deer, and I see him coming back, and I, I, I thought I was going to get him. I was like, I run down like three draws, and I think he's going to come out. Dude, like I knocked an arrow, got set up, and I was one draw too short, dude. He comes out at like 85 yards. Mm-hmm. And I'd already, again, preparation, I knew that 65 yards was the furthest that I could shoot and feel okay about shooting. Um, but he's still walking. He's kind of trotting, and he gets up. There's kind of this double fence. There's some power lines. 
and bloop, jumps one, bloop, jumps the other one and goes down into this little finger. And so I wait till he gets out of sight because I'm like standing in the wide open and I just go running down in there and I come up, I clear, I get over the fences and I go running in and I'm like, all of a sudden I just barely catch a glimpse of antlers and dude, like you would have thought like hit a sniper dirt. or something. I'm like, ah, oh, just like falling, like landing the snow. I'm already covered, right? Yeah. I just hit the deck, you know, <laughs> and he's standing in the middle of this buck brush. And I can just barely see him, but I can tell he's looking around. I think he's just trying to see if the coast is clear, mm-hmm. right? And because um, obviously the deer like to bed down, whether that was related to the injury. Like I said, the mm-hmm. first day he ran across the draw, laid down and looked at us. So Yeah, and that was only 80. 80 uh, he, you guys got within 80 yards of him or something? Yeah, I mean, soft bump, and he ran across the draw and then looked right back at us. Like, Bedded I, down I, right I, away. I, I think yeah. he just – I don't. I think those older guys – they learn to get off their feet. Yeah. Yeah. They don't want to leave those pockets. One of the things I was telling Pedro once was, look, this buck is in this little patch of brush, and it's a sea of grass yep. around him. And this is a bed he knows is safe and familiar. He doesn't want to leave it. No. He really doesn't want to leave it. So if he hears a noise or he sees something, and he's, he doesn't want to stand up. No. He, he He's like, dang it, I don't like that there's something above me. I think I heard it, but... I, I really don't want to move. And so if you play your cards right in country like that, on mm-hmm. a deer like that, these older deer, deer, a lot of times they'll resist the urge to stand up and blow out. And if you can, if you can just stay calm and don't draw and like do something stupid, those bucks will settle back down. And 30 minutes later, they for, forget that anything was going on. They fall right back asleep. I'm a hundred yards away. There's a little bit of topography. He's in this little draw. He, he laid in some of that buck brush, and it's snowing and windy as crap now. A storm, the storm's kind of flurrying back up, and I'm like, screw it, dude. I'm freaking going for it. And I just got on my stomach, dude, and just started crawling. Just as How deep is the snow? Six, seven inches probably. It's fresh, though? Fairly fresh, most of it. Yeah, I mean, it kept – we would get snow almost every single It wasn't evening. crunchy. No, it wasn't country. Uh, cr- crunchy, excuse me. Big advantage. So it's like – I'm just going to push the case. This is kind of a do or die, right? Yeah. I just, and to me in bow hunting or in hunting in general, you got to make a decision. You got to be willing to make a decision and then see it through whatever and, that decision. And live with it. And, and live with it, right? Yeah. And then I think through experience and as things happen, you learn to make better decisions, mm-hmm. but it's like, you just got to make a decision and give it a hundred percent. Guys that haven't been that successful out hunting or even with a bow, especially being a decision maker is the difference between winners and losers. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't even have to be the right decision. Just make a freaking decision. Make a decision. Same thing in business. Totally. Dude. Make a decision. Be the leader. Make the decision and then move, 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 move forward. Yep. Too many. It's shocking. You know, Corey Jacobson told me this one time. A guy called him up and was like, Corey, the bull's bugling to me and I'm bugling back. And, but I don't know what to do here. It's like, right now? Yes. Hang up the phone and <laughs> go kill it. Go kill it. Right. Like, but it's this indecision, right? Like, be 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 aggressive or or choose not to be aggressive. Right. Make your choice, run, and and run, then run after a deer through a foot, half a foot right. of snow, yep. or don't run after him. Yep. Make the decision and just see it through. No, you nailed mm-hmm. it. So then you start crawling, let's r- balls out, dude. I'm just <laughs> and it's like as fast as I can, right? Because I've got to cover some ground, but it's like again. Move slow. Don't be seen. Right. He's still looking around. I know there's other deer in the area, mm-hmm. and it's kind of like this rat race of like what? time. Yeah. Deer's on edge. He's just been. He just watched some freaking the Michelin <laughs> Man in puffy pants chase him <laughs> yeah. across the well, <laughs> Alberta. As you, as you say, like luck. I mean, you got so- quiet snow and heavy wind, and you don't Covers know it at this time, but. You know, he covered all that ground, but he's also still got an arrow in there, like, just gnawing at him. Yep. He, he, so not only does he want to lay down for safety and all that, but he's just like this. He's just looking for a chance to, like, draw. Probably. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And so, anyways, it, it just ended up working out great. Luck. The way. The how t- much, how, how far, far did you crawl? So I, I crawled to the, when I ranged him from the edge of the buck brush, he was 35 yards. So I probably only had to cover 50 to 70 okay. yards. Um, but That's I don't, a lot on your belly in the it's, snow. <laughs> it's a lot on your belly. And 
I'll talk about my release in a second because <laughs> I I'd practiced a shot earlier. I hadn't shot my bow while we were in camp because it was so cold. Yeah. And but I went out that the Friday morning I shot an arrow and my release was frozen. Mm. And so I knew that there was a chance that my could my release could freeze. So I had one of those hot hands, a couple like the big ones, mm -hmm. and I'd have those in my little kangaroo pouch and I would keep my hand yeah, I would just hold my there. hand in a ball. And I just had some like light merino Sitka gloves on so I could still feel the trigger and everything. But now I'm crawling. I've lost my hand warmers. <laughs> I'm cold. My yeah. hands are wet. And anyway, so I crawl. And anyways, there just happened to be like this little tiny like little ditch. It was probably a game trail or a cattle trail mm -hmm. that like, dude, I could like lay in it. Like my mm -hmm. chest could sit in it. And I'm just like shuffling like right. this and pushing my bow and then crawling and then pushing my bow and crawling and I get right to the edge of that brush and there just happened to be, the brush was probably five or six inches taller where I was that I knew with the topography and the brush, I was going to be able to get on my knees. I knew that the tip of my bow and my head could be exposed, but I knew that I could at least get, get on, to your knees get, before you like get brought to your my head knees up. before I got to figure something out. Right? right. And so I get there and I use range finding binoculars, huge advocate of range finding binos, such an incredible tool. Um, and I'm peeking up and I'm trying, I can see his horns, I can see the brush and I'm just trying to get a range and I can't hit, can't hit, can't hit. Finally, I get a hit 35, get another hit 35. I'm like, all right, the buck's 35 yards, right? So I come back down <laughs> <laughs> and sneak an arrow out of my quiver and uh, put it on my string and I'm sitting there and I look at my sight housing and it's like a ball of snow <laughs> and I'm like, oh no, dude, I'm a knucklehead. I didn't freaking even think of that. I don't know how I didn't think of that because it's not like I've never hunted in yeah, snow right. before, but just in the in the heat of the moment, I was like pushing my bones because I didn't want to like lift it yeah, up. He yeah, said right. I just was trying to stay as low as I could. And so, dude, I like get up. I'm like, well, no matter what, I got to get to my knees. I don't want to be sitting down here farting with. Them. I'm mm -hmm. going to get to my knees. So I'm going to at least be ready. And maybe if I draw back and can instinctually see my arrow, maybe I don't need to see my side. All these things are going through yeah, my head. Right. I'm just trying trying to make a decision. Yep. My decision is I'm getting to my knees and I'm cleaning out my top pin. <laughs> That's the pin I need. <laughs> 30, 40, 50. <laughs> so I get it and I clean the housing out the best I can and I can see my Your top pin is a 30 yard pin. Yep. I go 30, okay. 40, 50 is what I shoot. Cause mm -hmm. 20 and 30 is yeah. so negligible. Right. I'd rather have that 50 on the bottom end personally, and then slide from there. And again, knowing on this hunt, I'm like, I'm probably not going to be over 50 yards. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when I peeked up to range the deer, I could see the side of his chin. Um, but I could also see his butt. And so I knew this deer was laying straight away from me. I knew okay. that his rear was toward me. His, his whole body was perpendicular to me. Mm -hmm. And so my decision was, I'm not going to fiddle fart with, I'm not going to dial to 35. I'm going to put my 30 pin as tall as I feel I can lethally kill this deer. And I know that my arrow is going to drop. I know I'm shooting a slow bow. I'm shooting 60 pounds, but I know between his butthole and where I'm aiming I'm going to send an, a long, heavy arrow somewhere into his chest cavity. Yeah. And that was the decision I made. Okay. For people who aren't so good at math and all of that. Okay. So we have a deer. Imagine you're looking at it from the side. Matt is to your right. Deer is to the left. Okay. And the deer is facing away from you. Directly his, away. Directly, directly away. Directly away. His butt, his neck, his head, everything is directly away from you. So if you are shooting at him, you're going to be shooting up his butthole what they call a texas heart back, shot <laughs> or the back or the back of his head back of his neck his spine somewhere yep. in there right you know he's 35 yards that's your guess cuz yep. you ranged him a bunch yep. of times <clears throat> you got your 30 yard pin yep you're deciding where are you going to put that pin on the base of his neck the it's base of where his head. back meets his neck yes as his shoulders coming into his neck i know that i i know that my arrow isn't going to go any hit higher there. it's not going to go any higher right but it's probably going to stay lower than that. And here, I guess I didn't particularly practice aiming off mm -hmm. right before I sure. went, but I, I do that a lot Yeah. when I'm shooting. And again, it's for that situation. He's at 50, you draw back right. and it takes five steps. It's like, well, you knew with your 30 yard pin, you had to account for five yards. You got to aim higher. I got to hold off. You got to hold higher for that drop. Yep. I like where you're going with this to, to, because let's say it's really just 30 yards. 
Yeah. You're still putting it where it's going to kill if it was a 30 yard shot. Absolutely. Right. Like Absolutely. it's still going to hit the back of the spine, the neck somewhere in there, mm-hmm. but odds are you're calculating that yeah. drop a few yards. Yeah. And I'm not necessarily wanting the next shot, but I right. know but my arrow is going to the drop. last minutes. Do you have to shoot done, through brush? Do you see his butt clearly or is there brush? There's a little the bit of brush. He's laying in some brush. There's a little, little bit of stubble. And so that's another reason for holding off just a little bit. Like I'm anticipating that there's a chance I, I nick something. Mm-hmm. And Now, is the brush right up to his body or is it like leagues ahead of his body? He's just, he's, la- I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you, okay. honestly, when I first looked at him. Because there's, just- there's one thing to have an arrow deflect at 10 feet from the target, another from one foot from the target. It's on him. I, I know, I know it's okay. going to be that, that, that if I do hit stuff, it's within a, inches of an his arrow body, length or something an like arrow that. length okay. of his body, that it's not going to be a night and day difference. And again, in my mind, I've, I've made the decision that I believe that that's a lethal arrow. And I knew that. I mean, <laughs> yeah. it comes back to the, the margin of error. Do I want to shoot him in the spine? Absolutely not. Do I want to shoot him through the hip? No, not necessarily. But I know I've shot this arrow enough. The confidence in the arrow. The confidence Mm -hmm. in that arrow. I knew that I could get an arrow length into that deer. And maybe that meant that I had to shoot him again. Well, and look, dude, at this point, he already has an arrow in him. Like, you know he's been hit. You don't know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. When when, when that happens, you're taking shots. You All bets are off. All ethical kind of (laughs) rules turn into more arrows in him. Yeah. Well, that's the ethical thing, right? The yeah. ethical decision is now, now that I've taken the most ethical initial shot that I yep. could, the ethical thing is to bring this animal home. That's why we take 120 yard shots after we put one arrow in an animal. And it's like, well, you know, I, I saw, I saw a friend do that. You know, he, he took a 50 yard shot. It wasn't where it wanted was standing there at 120. He's a good archer. Took the shot. Then he hit it. Yeah. Now that's that 120 yard shot is not yeah <laughs> an ethical shot in normal circumstances. No. But having already put an arrow in, it's like yeah, keep going. Yep. It's the it 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 kind of just changes that paradigm, right? So yeah. going into that, going into that stock, going into that whole situation, I I I wanted to get another arrow in the deer, and I decided that that was going to yeah. be the most lethal and ethical let's, arrow that I could deliver. And let's talk about that too, because your arrow was a 500. Like 560. 560 grains. Yeah. I'm shooting 525, and I think that's heavy, you know. But 560 plus the Valkyrie, which is really a penetration arrow. It's yeah. the arrow meant for, like, uh, in the setup with the front of center and all of that and that head. I've put it through entire, n- n- you know, the th- the knuckle bones on yeah. elk and stuff, and it just shatters it. Uh, it I've is, seen. It's nasty, dude. Yeah, it's nasty. So, Again, back to your arrow and your setup. If you were shooting like a 400 grain setup with a little mechanical head, like I don't think I did, I don't think I mentally could have brought myself there. Yeah, but I, I mean, I mean, for right or wrong, I believed and knew if I made if I executed that shot that we were going to get the deer. That's just yeah, that was the decision I made. So clean out my site housing. We've got a range on this deer. I've decided what I'm going to do. And I get to my knees and I'm kind of <clears throat> looking at him and I'm getting set up. I remember kind of just, oh, I need to turn my body. I don't want to shoot at him this way. I mm-hmm. need to turn my body a little bit more. So I remember shifting and I don't know if he picked up on me, but I'm looking through the tips of my the Hoyt bow, right? So it's got this split, split limbs. limbs and I watch that deer's horns flip and look right at me. And I'm like, can you see his eyes? I can't see his just eyes. his horns. I can just barely okay. see like here up. Yep. 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 And I'm just like, I don't think he's got me. I don't think he's got me. And I'm just staring at like, it's funny. Cause I like talk to the animals. This is where head. most, <laughs> I hate to say it, but this is where most guys go. Boop. Wet the bed. Correct. <laughs> Over. Correct. And I was just going to say like, with you talking yourself through it with the animal, it's like experience and being in those situations <laughs> before. It, 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 usually when like I bow hunting, usually if I could, like an elk's come into a water hole, mm-hmm. I'm telling that animal it's dead the whole way there. Yeah. I mean, you're dead. I got you. Yep. I got you. And so in my mind, as I'm, mentally talking to this deer i'm like you can't see me mm-hmm. you don't have me. yeah you don't, you don't got me dude and i'm just sitting there waiting you know i don't know if he is going to stand up i don't know is it going to be explosive is it going to be delayed I've, I've seen both from this deer at this point right, right. <laughs> and uh there was there had been some other deer kind of across the draw feeding out and he decided he wanted to look and i just watched his antlers come turn away how long did he look at you how long did you have to freeze there man i 
10 minutes, but it was 30 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> I, I bet you around 10 seconds. Okay. I bet you. Still probably. long enough to. But it's what you talked about. It's He was in a spot he wanted to be, and he didn't want to leave. Mm-mm. He didn't want to leave. He, I'm sure he heard some, some senses. You're in his bubble. He, he picked up on something, yeah. but he's like. We're in the red zone here. But yeah. he's like, I don't want to move. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think they got me. In his mind, he's saying you don't got yeah. me, and I'm saying you don't got me, right? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, anyways, I know, I watch his antlers turn away, and I see him pick his ears up to try and listen. And when they pick their ears up, they can't see behind mm-hmm. them. You know, their ear, ear, eyes kind of sit on the side of their head. But when those ears come up, yeah, they can't see. And as soon I as I didn't really, I this is news to me. Yeah, but I guess you're right. Up. Yeah, because yeah. they yep. they pretty much can see behind them. Absolutely. Yeah, when, yeah. Especially antelope. Antelope, right? exactly. Yeah, antelope, like, are, antelope are the yeah, worst. Like and their, heads are, their ears are more on top of their heads. But those mule deer, um, you know, they got big old floppy mm-hmm. ears, right? And that's kind of just been my experience. I've watched the ears. Yeah. That's kind of been a body language thing that I've cued in on, especially watching a bedded deer. You can watch their ears. Right. You know, you see that ear flicking back at you. He's like, he's trying to hear what's behind him. He's not yeah, going to exactly. look at me, but he's yeah. trying to decide mm-hmm. if he hears something, if he wants to run. But watching both of those ears flip forward is so- not just that too. The the hearing is so directional as well. Absolutely. So he just gave up his. He gave up the cones, right? Mm-hmm. And as soon as I saw those tips, uh, the tips of his ears, it was I immediately drew my bow, and I sat up and I put that pin right where I decided that I was going to put it, and start going. I'm my shot process is get there, set, and sets when I trip the mm-hmm. the safety sear and aim, 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 and I just aim until that shot goes. And there, set, aim, 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 and dude, I'm pulling as hard as I can. And I'm like in the back of my head, it's like, you sucker, your release is frozen. <laughs> And it, and, <laughs> and in my head, I'm just saying, aim, 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 and I'm just pulling as hard. Joel as Turner's I can. like tapping <laughs> on the head with an arrow, <laughs> dude. And sure enough, it was just that that internal conflict, you know. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. You were talking about building that mental blueprint and the the mental exercise to prolong your ability to focus. Right, mm-hmm. like it's a battle. And I was on the tail end of that battle of aim, 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 right. and I'm just staring at that freaking pin, dude. And I can, I can tell at this point he started to. I'm sure he's moving and stuff. Anyways, shot breaks, boom, and I just hear that boom, and I'm like, got him. I know I just put a good arrow on that deer. And when when you were aiming there, um, we, you know, because there's a lot of tension now because you're pulling harder than you normally would. Yeah. But you were still feeling like your peep site housing, all that was aligned. Your Everything pin was, was there. It was stuck right Everything where it needed to be. Everything was there. I can I can vividly remember that. I remember that pin just being That's right awesome. there. And so I just pulled as hard as I freaking <laughs> could, dude. I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Anyways, shot breaks. I know that I've just uh, I know I've just connected with this deer. Jumps out of his bed. He and he doesn't bound. He just runs and he runs like. 40, 50 yards or so, and he's just hunched up. And he's standing there. And at this point, he's, you know, 70 plus yards from me, right? He's out of my shooting range. Well, unfortunately, at that yeah. point, I wish I would have right. had, had 80 yards. I would have been shooting again. Yeah. I, and that was kind of my plan. I was like, even if this first arrow doesn't go ideally how I want it to, I'm going to hope for the yeah, best and right. aim for the best. Um, but in my mind, I'm like, I'm get. I mean, as soon as I shot, I loaded another arrow because yeah. I was hoping that I was going to get another shot there. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to stop shooting until they fall. That's just my, my yep, personal yep, my personal deal. I I learned that too. It's like when you're more experienced and you're more aggressive, it's like the second that shot goes off, you're already getting the next one out, yeah. and yeah. you're like already at like you're you're already in the game plan, and it's not over, it's not over, it's not over. When you're not experienced, you do or or just. It, these situations aren't something you thought through ahead of time or practiced enough. Yeah. That shot goes and I've been with so many guys and they do it and then and then they're not getting another arrow out. Yeah. It's hoot and holler or grab my binos or they're whatever. Just, you they're know, grabbing it's, their binos. They're just looking and it's like, no, grab your other grab your, grab your, Or stand up to look you know, and it's, it's like, like no like stay down. And and there's so many opportunities where and it's happened to me before I got better. I've done it. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's how I learned. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately. Absolutely. You you've we've all made those mistakes, right? And so it's like yeah. Again, I'm I'm trying to get another arrow on the way. He stops. He's hunched. He probably walks another twenty yards and he turns broadside. 
And so at this point, I mean, I'd set my bow down, I'm cleaning off my binos and I'm trying to look at the deer and, you know, I just belly crawled through the snow and I left my bino harness open. So there was some snow on there. Obviously I I could see enough to range him, but just, it was snowing. Uh And between that time, some snow had accumulated on the top of the top of them and clean them off. And I'm looking at this deer, trying to get him in focus and he's standing there and I can see that his tail's lifted. He's holding his tail really weird. And I look underneath and I can just barely see the end of my green fletchings and like the yellow glow of, I'm not shooting a luminock, but like, just like the yeah. yellow glow of that east and knock. And I'm like, dude, I shot him right up. <laughs> Texas right, heart shot. Texas heart shot. I shot, <laughs> him, I shot him right up the butt. So, I mean, from where, I mean, my arrow probably dropped. Such a fatal six, shot. It, it is such a fatal shot. Is, but man, what a painful, uh, <laughs> I know, dude. So, <laughs> I mean, favorite. so my arrow probably dropped five or six inches from right. where I was yeah. holding, right? Mm-hmm. To be able to drop down in there. Anyways, he laid down there um, and he laid down and his head was still up. You couldn't put your 35 pin on his, on that spot if you had wanted to, correct? Because there was no you're, aiming you're point. You're pin gapping anyway. Yeah, I'm, I'm but, pin but, gapping anyways, but. But there was brush in the way, right? To see yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you just picked an aim spot on the animal itself. I aimed where I could aim and know that that's what I was aiming yep, at. Yep, yep, yep. Smart, smart. Um, deer runs down there, and it was probably two or maybe maybe it was five minutes. He'd have he'd have his head up. In this point, he's looking back. He's looking back towards me. So I feel like I'm pinned. And you're and you're second guessing what you've seen, right? Like yeah. I saw him broadside. Did I shoot him in, off to the side of his cheek? Did I shoot him right up the poop shoot? Like where yeah. did I? I know that's where my arrow is, but like. I didn't see yeah. him going straight Is away. It, I don't know. Yeah. I don't. Did it kick out his side? Did I hit a rib right. and deflect? I don't know any of this, right? So I'm watching this deer, and his head's up, and finally he kind of starts laying his head down, and then he'd pick it back up, and he did that once or twice. I'm like, "Is he dying?" Like it's like, and at this point, it's like basically, I don't even know if there was any t- legal time left or whatever. And so I started counting when he'd put his head down, I'd start counting and it progressively got longer. And I'm like, okay, he's dying. And, uh, anyways, he ended up expiring there and got down to him and walk up and I want to know where I shot this deer. Right. And sure enough, I mean, just off the top of his butthole towards the top of his back is where that arrow went in. And I mean, I shoot full length arrow, big, long broadhead. I mean, there was 33 inches of arrow. So you got to think the, the length of a deer diaphragm lungs. I mean, it was liver all up in his goodies. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mm -hmm. it, it was buried in there. Very, very lethal. A lot of internal bleeding though. That's why he's going to take a little minute longer than if it was just losing blood pressure. out. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So not a, not necessarily a a (laughs) fairy tale ending to the pursuit of an incredible animal, but nonetheless. That's bow hunting. That's about hunting, exactly. It's hunting. It's hunting. Yeah, it's true. Hunting. <laughs> true. <laughs> I've been there with true. the gun too. So. No, you're right. You're right. I think. I think. I think that's hunting, and it's and it's knowing that that I feel maybe gives you that additional drive to finish the job. Yeah. Mm-hmm. To know that well, that's it's your just, responsibility. Your goal is, is no matter what the situation, good or bad, good shot, bad shot. The end goal is okay. If I did get a shot on this animal, is to get another shot to make it a lethal shot to get that animal down. Like we obviously want yep. them to expire as fast as possible yep. every single time. Yep. It's hunting. It doesn't always happen that way. Finish well, the job. Finish That's the what job. I tell myself. Mm-hmm. Finish the job. Well, and I yep. think with archery, um, you know, it's hemorrhaging. You're, you're mm-hmm. causing an animal to bleed out typically to death or Correct. if you're doing it right, you know, and, uh, it's just the nature of the equipment. Um, it can be the fastest kill you've ever seen. Yep. Yep. It can also, take way longer and there's so many more variables i think so often variables yeah and again it's hunting because the same thing can happen with the rifle can yep you know i'd say um but when you were talking about aiming or on that deer it, i was hunting coos deer with brad the first was it 2020 our first uh hunt one of our first hunts together second yeah. one we hunted 2019 elk yep and i was i was moving through uh after this big buck on a doe and we were kind of just creeping up on them and uh, another buck comes in and they have this little thing and well <clears throat> they didn't notice us and i came to full draw a few times but didn't quite get the shot i wanted then this this cool buck with like these curly horns called wavy and wavy like a really neat little coos deer he beds down right i'm like sitting there in the grass the whole time and he beds down and coos deer are tiny 
And he's yeah. uh, he's, what he's not telling is I screwed it up on the big buck, and this is the <laughs> buck that gave him the opportunity. <laughs> yes. So anyway, <laughs> this buck is sixty three yards, but I don't know that because the grass is kind of tall, and he's he lays down on the hill, and he's kind of this way, and he's straight down from me. So I get the binoculars out and I scan this buck for a long time, trying to figure out how he's laying down, mm-hmm. where his legs are, where yep. his head How's his is. Body? How's his body shape? And then I see that the the stripe down his back where his spine is. And I'm seeing where his shoulder is and then where his butt in the middle. And I and I and I find a piece of grass that's super yellow, like bright, bright, bright yellow. And I'm like, okay. And I look at it with my naked eye and I'm like, I can see the grass. And I put him back up and I confirm after a while that if I aim for that piece of grass, his body's right on the other side. I'm right? gonna smash his spine. Yeah. And I mean, with the coos deer laying down, you got like this yeah, width, it's like, a it's like eight inches or something. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a so dog. I'm like, okay. So, um, you know, it's 63 yards. I dial single pin. I think I had a zero actually. You had a zero. And we had been shooting that exact yardage, like 20 arrows four hours before, three hours yeah. before. So, I mean, I, I, I was like busting arrows. So yeah. I'm like, all right. So I'm like, well, come to full draw. This is tough shot, it, but it's bedded. It's all these things. But if I aim for that piece of grass, um, cause I didn't really have an aim point on the deer at all. All I can see is his head. Yeah. But because I used the binos to pick out that spot, I could just pick that grass. I knew if I hit that grass, I was gonna hit the deer. Yeah. And then I just came to full draw. And, and I always have that attitude at like, when I come to full draw on an animal, that doesn't mean I'm going to shoot it. No. Right. Like yep, I'm yep. coming to full draw and it's like, I'll see how things progress. Yeah. And my feeling like I've, I'm not committed. Mm-hmm. So I got there and I put the pin on there and I start to pull through and I'm like, no, this is feeling really good. Yep. Okay. And I th- might've let down and done it the second time. I don't remember, but don't remember either. either way I pulled through the perfect shot, hit him in the spine. Didn't even get off the ground. It was over, yeah. yep. you know, but aiming, finding those creative, like aim points, aim points. Yep. I really needed, especially for me, but especially for such a small target, I needed an exact aim. Point. I need to put that pin there and really be able to focus gotta be that to, spot. You got to be able to see it. Yeah. And some guys might've taken their 35, third, you know, split the pin and like put where they thought they would hit through grass. Yeah. And I found like, you better pick out your grass or your bush or whatever. I need something to aim at. Yeah. Personally. You need an aim and point. Yeah. And that's yeah. why I highly recommend for an archer, like the Western hunting summit that we do the 3d course or attack or whatever. Yeah. A lot of times you have a debris, say a 60 yard target and you have grass and you can't see the actual vitals, but you're yeah. like picking a piece of grass and it's like, okay, I know that's my aim point. It's cool. Like I, that's, that's it's on the deer, yeah. but it's 20 yards in front of the deer. And you hit that aim point, your arrow arcs over it and sinks right into the target. That reminds me of one of my best shots I ever made was on this, that mountain goat. Uh, I shot the goat down. Yeah. Then I shot it on the run at 40 and just blew out its hip. <laughs> Josh was pretty happy with that too. Uh, and then it ran down da, 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 and we got on the on it and it was behind a rock and it was popping its head up, putting its head down. Popping its, and all I could see was the white stripe of its back on the other side of the rock and his head. So he had bedded there and he just, every time we got close, he'd run away again, run away again. Mm. And it was 60 yards to his, to his back. But, um, I knew from the tack that, that, uh, the arc of your arrow, the arc of my arrow will drop it right, right in. Cause they set up targets that block the target. Oh yeah. And you just, you have yeah. to aim at the rock. Yep. Yeah, Sean. Sean wants your arrows. So, yeah. <laughs> you have to aim at the rock, and and but know that it's not going to hit the rock. I will yeah. say, Lampers is way more unforgiving than <laughs> Sean at Total Archer Challenge. Yeah. Like the courses he sets up, they are hard. They That's are good. hard. It's good. So, but I ranged it, and I'm like, no, I got it. I got it, guys. I got it. And uh, I forget the guy that was there with us, and I'm like, he's like, but he's behind the rock. I'm like, it's going to drop in. <laughs> <laughs> and I had the hinge, boom, and I just took my time. Poof, and that arrow went, and it literally just skimmed the rock, went right in his vitals, and uh, third shot. And so, so I felt like a damn hero, um, <laughs> Robin Robin Hood. Heck yeah! Uh, uh, but um, yeah, it's archery is just cool like that. Yep. It's just fun knowing um, your equipment, hundred percent inside and out, understanding what it does, practicing for those situations, making decisions, and sticking to them, mm-hmm. and tr- and trusting that that experience leading up to that decision. It gives you a lot of confidence yeah. when you can trust it. So, 
So he goes down and uh, – there he is. The there he is. History. There, there he is. Pretty, man. pretty sweet deer. Ninety-three inches of <laughs> the most superior animal on the face of the <laughs> earth. Mule deer. Oh, dude, I love it. So we're here at Final Rise. We actually made our 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 a little trip up here to uh, to your. What is this? Your business office? The, the, well, is, the, it, you, is it the warehouse? <laughs> what do we call this? The mothership. <laughs> <laughs> so progress, you know, from the basement of our house to to the warehouse here. Um, this will kind of become our fulfillment center. I actually it was funny. Oh, yeah. Right after I, I was talking to you on the phone, I was sitting outside of of one of the partners that we've uh, contract sewed through for the past couple of years, and I just acquired their business oh, at wow. the end of this last year. So nice. we'll have a uh, an offsite sewing facility, which is primarily sewn the majority of our stuff, uh, anyways, which has been incredible. Um, yeah, I'm up there a couple times a week, and so um, kind of just rearranging stuff here internally. Still have quite a few machines that we still use for accessories and whatnot, but uh, this will kind of just become the fulfillment center. So yeah. we'll be able to do all of our sewing hundred percent offsite, open up some more space out here and just utilize this place a little bit more. Tell folks about final rise. Yeah. So final rise, this is, this was kind of, uh, I think like a lot of companies, it was kind of just a side hustle at one point in time. <laughs> it was, it was a, a hope to put more gas in the hunting truck and maybe be able to hunt deer or elk out of state. Uh, as I was working for, for mountain ops and things had grown and progressed, you know, we'd, really hired some great talented people and it went from startup mode of everybody wears 90 hats to like, Hey, you kind of have your lane. And so I went in from never not working, you know, constantly being on the phone with the Harbertson brothers and doing this and that to all of a sudden I had free time and I didn't know what to do with it. And I'm not one to watch TV or anything like (laughs) that. I'm like, you know, like I know how to sew. Uh, my parents own an industrial sewing business all growing up. Ironically enough, my dad's shop was Kitty Corner from <laughs> really? Really? Yeah, growing up. So I used to be down here all the time. And uh, I've always I've always sewn. I've always known how to sew. I've enjoyed playing with my backpacks, with my camo, with my mm-hmm. gear. And, um, you know, big mule deer are, are obviously a passion, but I really love bird dogs and I love upland mm-hmm. hunting. That's probably... And you like chucker hunting, which is like the pinnacle of bird hunting. <laughs> so... <laughs> I love, yeah, absolutely. So that's, that's kind of been a giant passion of mine for a number of years now. I've done that. Yeah. I hunted with you and Jay Byer. Yeah. And I was like, these birds suck. (laughs) I love chuckers. (laughs) Chuckers suck. And Matt and I have talked a bunch of like, we need to get out. We need to get out. We have yet to get out. I know. We have till January 31st. I like it. I like it. (laughs) February 15th here, dude. So we got to host the 31st. (laughs) So, so, uh, and anyway, so I, I, you know, I'm, passionate bird hunter and look at the upland space I'm like man there's there's obviously some great products but it was very fairly stagnant yeah mm-hmm. there hadn't been a lot it's of the normal vest with a pouch in the back yeah and there were a couple you know strap vests were already existing there were a couple companies mm-hmm. making them but i'm like looking at the at the big game space and golf and all these other it's like dude just every year new gear new components new textiles right. new garments and just like just moving so fast and like here's this sport that i love and that is like taken taken my heart and mm-hmm. it's like kind of over here i'm like man i've got these really cool high-end backpacks that like i understand the value of that like mm-hmm. i know how to load a backpack i know yeah. how to distribute that weight right. what if i take some of my experience from big game hunting and backpacking and using gear you know yeah working in the outdoor industry i've got you know pro deals so i've owned a lot of great backpacks and yeah. i'm like you know there's all these cool features that I think you could incorporate and, you know, spin up and improve in your own ways that would make right. it applicable to that space. And this was kind of just a melting pot or final rise is kind of just a melting pot of like all my personal experience in this point in life, sewing, mm-hmm. loving gear, designing gear and business. I love business. I love yeah. marketing. And so it's been fun to kind of just express myself um, through our through products. That. And it's mm-hmm. been, it's been incredible, man. I have some experience, you know, working with a few companies. Uh, uh, we worked with quite a bit with Peaks and Initial Ascent, Lampers and I both. Yeah. Uh, and now, Brad, where we test the hell out of stuff. Mm-hmm. And because we're such intense users of yep. all this type of equipment, I feel like we have a inside line on what's missing. Totally. And I, what when needs I to first, be changed. Yeah, yeah, when I first started doing it, we got like – Gators, for example, yeah. the Peaks Gator. Best Gators I've used, by the way. 
they're bar none. Yeah, and yeah. we. But I had came up to it like, what what could I offer in terms of you know improving a gator? Yeah, or building a gator. I'm just a guy who uses them all the time. Yeah. Well, that's the guy who who kind of I can tell you what the problems are, but if I got the right guy who can design the solutions, we're a powerful team. Yeah, that's the magic sauce. And I didn't. I underestimated the value of that. And I've seen other companies roll out some gators, roll out some, some, you know, a teepee or whatnot. And, and I can, now I can look at it and go, that's not going to work Yeah, right off the bat. And one of the reasons, and I wonder sometimes, why did you roll that out? Didn't, didn't anybody use it before you you test it it? out? Didn't anybody like, I could have worn that. You could have worn that in one heavy winter and you'd have been like bad idea. Yeah. One week long hunt and you could have aborted that. You yeah. know, and so what I learned over over time now is the the guy who uses it the most, and and then and then fixes the problems, yep. is generally going to be the guy that comes out with the best stuff. Yeah, and that's the advantage over the company with all the money, totally versus the, the company with the doer, the I actual agree. backpacker mm-hmm. yep. in it. Hundred percent. And I think. Uh, because I just shake my head sometimes that some stuff that REI type brands roll out and you're like, you guys are, you guys are now doing that in a boardroom <laughs> on a whiteboard. Right. You know, you're not actually, it looks good. No dude is out there actually living the dream with that stuff. Yeah, yep. totally. There, and there, I think there's, I think that's a, a common trait of, of growth within some reason. I think a lot of companies start yeah. out with passion and mm-hmm. that they become very hyper-focused on particular products. And then, diversification equals growth, right? Scalability, that's yeah, kind of the yeah. bread and butter. And so I th- I, that's where I th- feel like sure. you see a lot of those me twos, but it is like, I've looked at it, right? I mean, I mean, we have American manufacturer and that's another thing that's like we, like kind of our MO, it's it's all American source and all American made. Like all this stuff is made here. I've got pallets of fabric, American fabric mm-hmm. in these warehouses, yeah. you know? And it's like, I, I take pride in that instead of yeah. hitting a copy and paste. I mean, yeah, I could grab a competitor's product, send it overseas and they could have it, torn mm-hmm. apart and to me for a fraction of the cost in no time. Right. And I could hide behind the scenes and manipulate and do different things like that. But like, I want to take pride in what I'm doing. And so everything you said from all the field experience using the great gear that did exist, but having ideas on how that could improve. And I do live this. this is yeah. Really I was going to say you, you were probably is... out there going, this is close, but man, if they did this, this, and this, yeah. it would be ideal. Yeah. And, uh, but they weren't, and it just, I think, I mean, again, this is an expression of me, right? This is all my personal field experience. Right. This mm-hmm. is my sewing experience. This is my marketing sure. and business experience. And it's like, it's, it's just been super, super fun. It's like, man, like this is something I've been able to build on my own and people. And it's, it's, it, and you've probably seen it in the, in the processes you've been involved in, but like people see the product and they experience it and they're like, finally, somebody fixed it. Yeah. Yeah, like everybody knew it was and, a problem, but nobody thing, said anything. They just put up with it. It doesn't yeah. have to be something big, but just a little bit of innovation can go away very, very long. Yeah. Ways. I always say a hundred pennies make a dollar. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's the little tiny things that only you can learn in true field experience. I believe yeah, for sure in actually being a representative of whatever your product re- is reflective of. Hundred percent. Yep. So. Yep. Well, right now, what are, what are the birds you're uh, the most into right now? Always, always chucker. Is always, it chucker? Always chucker. I mean, I've, they're, they're all, I love what them What about all. in Alberta? Like, uh. Sharp tails and hunts. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. We, well, that's what we were hunting. So that's what we were about. <laughs> <laughs> no, but here, I mean, this is prime time for mm-hmm. chucker. I mean, you get a little bit of snow on the ground, kind of like mm-hmm. what we experienced. Um, man, it's just perfect. It's cool enough outside. Is the it dog. the birds or the dogs? Be honest. It's the, it's the dogs. It's the dogs and the dog work on chucker and the chucker themselves. It's the like chal- hunting elk. It, it's they're they're challenging for the dog. Yeah. It, it's challenging for you physically, mm-hmm. not only to get to the birds, but being able to shoot the birds. Right. Yeah, like the whole thing. I really enjoy the challenge of it to like Absolutely. go out and put a couple chucker in your vest. Like, dude, you've done something. We, exactly. We bird hunted uh, on Kodiak. Yeah, with Tyler, ptarmigan. Uh, no, we were no, no, sea ducks. It was oh, all sea ducks. ducks. We, yeah, I'm a professional duck hunter now. I got two harlequins on my, under my belt. We Darn wanted, we, now we wanted to, <laughs> we wanted to upland hunt, and we we actually looked around for them. But but we were we were on the ducks, and um, it was great. 
and uh, I tried to pump a shotgun. That's not Didn't a pump. Need to be pumped. Yeah, uh, <laughs> he's like, he, and he jacks the shell out. Oh, I have we have video of this. I got to watch. We, the video it doesn't of it. matter. It doesn't matter. It's neither here nor there. It's not okay. important. The point is, uh, it it sort of rekindled the desire to do a little bird hunting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. and the do- the dogs make it right. Like there's just yeah. something about watching a dog. Yeah, get into scent. He slows down. He's methodical. He's working, and then just. Boom! Just yeah. stick a covey of birds, and you're like, mm. like, dude, I get more, I get buck fever more yeah. walking in on a dog <laughs> that's just like, mm, got him on yeah. chucker, yeah. than I do shooting. That's hilarious. Elk. Like I really do. Like I mean, equipment's so efficient, you know, bows and rifles and stuff. And then there's no guarantees, but it's like, I feel like if I get something in the crosshairs with a rifle, I just, I believe, I have the confidence mm-hmm. that you're dead. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If I get to full draw and I've got a pin on you and it's clear, I believe I'm going to get you a chucker. I have no idea what the <laughs> hell's about to happen, dude. You might fly up between my feet. You might exactly. crisscross me. Like, you might fly in front of my dog or I can't shoot. And it goes and real even fast. even if I do shoot at you, I may not get <laughs> exactly. you, even though I'm flipping a bunch of pellets through the right. air. Like. <laughs> and then guess what? i got to hike to the bottom of the mountain so just to turn around and hike back to the top. That's right. Um, where I live, by the way, like in Cache, uh, there's a bajillion uh, pheasant. Yeah, there's still a ton of pheasant there's out there. There's so many pheasants. Yeah. Like at my house, there's probably, yep. I it's see all probably, private. That's the crap. I see like 20 egg. pheasants a day or so. Yeah, and you guys, you guys have a They're in my backyard slurs. running around. I love it. Wild, wild pheasants still do it for me. So mm-hmm. I actually went, I was with So Jeff. are there some places you can hunt over there that are public at all? Um, I mean, yeah. I, I got my neighbors, so they... they they might hook me up, but yeah, there and I mean between me, you, and the mountain, there's quite a few chucker over by Logan. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> yep. you just gotta, you just gotta. There's pick. also like 400 turkeys. There's a pile of turkeys in cash. Yeah, they're everywhere. Yeah. Like, well, I'll of, see a hundred. But they're all on private. I'll yeah, see a, a I'll see a hundred or two hundred over here, and then I'll drive down the road another mile, and there'll be another hundred, and then, and then another mile, another hundred or so. Yeah, there, there's. I hunted up there quite a bit. Yeah. For just over the counter turkey and stuff like that, but there's there's so many people doing it now. I stopped yeah. going there. I I try to knock doors and <laughs> or just go mm-hmm. hunt out of state. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> Where turkeys act like turkeys, it's kind of like elk in Utah. Like, yeah, you might call one in, but right. I mean, not that you can't. But you go to some of the other places where you guys get back in, and it's like you got an animal one on one. That's fun. Mm-hmm. I'll drive a long ways. Well, and I hike, got hike some further to do that. Idaho chucker spots. Let's just say when. <laughs> Say when. When. <laughs> <laughs> when. All right. Uh, well, we better la- wrap this up. Uh, cameras are dying. But uh, uh, Matt, thanks for having us up here today. It was great to get the story. I love it. It's good to see you again. And uh, folks, check out the video. Go over on the Hush channel yep. and uh, you see this buck on his feet. Very cool. Uh, appreciate you, man. Appreciate you too, Brian. Thanks so much. Thanks, folks. Thanks for tuning in. Stay gritty.